Good evening, John. Hey, good evening, everybody. So when people come on, I've got them, I've got them on mute. Um, and you know that you know the deal throughout the throughout the evening I keep hitting that mute button because someone's got a barking dog or someone's someone's friend or partner's doing the dishes and it clangs around so but that isn't that's uh, that's not too bad. It's too cold. Did, did you get your your uh, situation sorted out? Your your clutch. You're on mute, Stu. So I can't uh, you press your space bar. Yeah. No, I still got a bit of a problem with it, John. Okay, well, talk, talk to me tomorrow or something, and and we'll we'll work through it. Thank I think we'll be much. talking probably about engines tonight. So, thank you. Well, so we got forty three people on, but we got three minutes to go here. And I'm hoping that our, our guest of honor tonight can get on without much trouble, uh, Kemp Prather. But we'll see, see how it all works out. It's amazing that this thing works anyway. When I was a kid, you know, you watched Captain Midnight. He had that big screen up on the wall and he could see who he was talking to. They couldn't see him, but now it's real. And we can talk to each other. It's amazing. And talk to each other in groups. It's amazing. We don't have to call you Captain Midnight now, do we? <laughs> Captain Midnight. There were some really, I, I, you know, for a kid, you know, on a Saturday morning, boy. Then there's oh, Rocky, yeah. Rocky Jones, Space Ranger. You know, and if you if you looked at the episode of that today, it would be so awful. But at the time, you know, when I was, I don't know how old I was, six, eight, ten, it was great stuff. Miss the Lone Ranger. My hero, the Lone Ranger. Yeah. John, I always I always like Zorro. Him too. <laughs> Zorro. Yeah. Yeah. And really. the Cisco and Kid. There's yeah, the Cisco Kid. Absolutely. Hey, Pancho. Hey, Cisco. Oh, Pancho. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cisco. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When the, the night when the full moon is bright, comes a horseman known as Zorro. <laughs> hey, we, hey, we're all living our childhood. <laughs> Rin Tin Tin, remember the the Foreign Legion and the and uh, yeah, between that and Lassie, all the dog shows and the horse shows. I watched uh, I watched uh, Mr. Ed. Oh, it must have been six years ago. Just a, in twenty minutes, I think that's all all they were. It's push the ads in; it makes it half an hour. They're just so stupid. They're so funny. That that show was on for like eight eight seasons. Back when the seasons meant years. Oh, Wilbur! Yeah. Yeah, like, How about uh, <laughs> Soldiers of Fortune? Tim Kelly and Tubo Smith. Don't that remember was, that. Was on all. a few years, yeah. John Russell was Tim Kelly. Went on to be the lawman. Combat with Vic Morrow. You know, yeah. you, we used to watch that on AFVN television in Vietnam. It's kind of weird, kind of weird. You know. Hey, it's seven o'clock. We got 90 people on, so I'm gonna start to ramp up here and uh, start talking about today and what we're gonna do. And you know what I'm gonna do though? I'm gonna take a break here for just a minute and grab my microphone. Hi, John. Greetings from Africa. So yeah, here's here's my microphone. I uh, forgot to plug that in. I was thinking about getting a camera. I know this can make me sound a little bit better, but a camera, I don't think a camera can make me look any better. So <laughs> we'll, we'll stick with this. So we've got 105 people right now, it's climbing. So this is our Zoom. This is our, our first Zoom of the month. It's the second Monday of the month. We'll have another one on the fourth, which is April 26th. So this is how it works. Everybody comes on, they're on mute. I've got a big button here that says mute everybody. And I hit that 
almost every time we get done talking about something. So it shuts everybody down. And then if you want to unmute yourself, you can go through the laborious process of, of taking your cursor down to the bottom and unmuting yourself or simply press the space bar. And then you can unmute yourself for as long as you might want to talk. So we'll, we'll, take, uh, we'll take questions from chat. That's the usual way. Um, so when I read your name on chat or something, if you're still on, if you can get on, um, then, then you can tell us where you're from. That's always interesting to know. And then we'll talk about whatever problem you've got and we'll get that, we'll get that sorted out. And then I hit mute all again. If just, I don't know, we're talk, supposed to be talking about engines tonight, but um, if, if, um, if you've got something to add, just, just break in, just break in. It's, it's not too bad. If 15 people try to do that at once, it's really awful, but usually it's just one or two. And, and very often people have got a, a different way to do something. So it's really nice. So notes for tonight. The first note is today is Cecil Kimber's birthday. A fact that I'm always aware of during April, but I never really know what day it is because I'm not that tuned into it. But um, I found out tonight um, that uh, Kimber's birthday is on the 12th. So he would have been 133 years old. And one plus three plus three only equals seven. So next year, when he'll be 134 years old, one plus three plus four will equal eight. Numerology does figure in a little bit into MGs. The factory phone number adding in 251. That's why the serial numbers on the cars began at 251 for years until, until uh, the TF started up. Uh, it was under BMC. Um, so two plus five plus one equals eight. So all kinds of fun stuff you, you can do. I got a note today. I, I sent out, for those of you who, who have contributed to my PayPal, account. Thank you very, very kindly. M many of you know that I responded in mass today. I was too embarrassed to come on tonight without having sent thank you letters out to everyone who's been so kind. So if you want to be kind again, you go to my website, you go up to the upper right hand corner and press the PayPal button. And it's very, very nice. Anyway, I got a note back today from David Stein, um, who said, uh, his note here says, you probably don't remember, but I reached out to you around 1980 after buying an MGB new from the dealer in St. Louis, Missouri. JRT was just under, um, was just going under and there was a big rebate for buying those late model MGs. When it started to get cold, I couldn't get my B to downshift or go into reverse. The dealer called in the regional tech rep uh, who slip shifted it through the gears without the clutch and proudly declared there was nothing wrong and denied the service claim. Uh, David goes on and says, I reached out to you and you diagnosed it as a burr on the spigot bushing. With my letter from John Twist, I marched back into the dealer and they replaced the clutch on my brand new MGB. So anyway, David, thank you. <laughs> That's nice. I looked, I tried to find the original letter, it, but it's embarrassing because I threw away so many, you know, we're all, we all have our own uh, character traits. Uh, I have a certain amount of obsession. How else would you get so deep into a subject as MG? And I, but I threw away, surprise, surprise, hundreds of technical letters, probably 20 years ago. And it's too bad, because I would have loved to come up with the original letter and say, and this is what I wrote. But anyway, the other note that I wanted to make um, was that I just got in the mail. Oh, I can't see it. If I take, if I get rid of my background here, just a moment. Let's get rid of my background, choose virtual background, just a moment. Uh, we're coming off this. There we go. None. 
Here we go. Now we got Classic MG Magazine. Now this is printed by Larry Sonata out of Columbus, Ohio. And I was just down there, just in Columbus last week, Friday. If I'd had some more time, I would have stopped and called on Larry. He does that magazine himself. It's um, North American um, Classic MG Magazine. Dick Lunny used to, used to print it. Now Larry does. So maybe we'll get Larry on sometime soon and talk about his magazine and and uh, and and stuff. That 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 would be fun. So the numbers. We always have to do a little housekeeping. The numbers. Uh, my constant contact mailing list is now up to forty nine hundred ninety four. I'm waiting for it to cross five hundred. But every time I send out a mailer, uh, then there are people who you know who press the buttons and say the content is no longer relevant to me, or I never signed up for your newsletter, then why didn't you complain before or why, you know, only the people who go on the website and, and, and press um, join our newsletter get on this list. Um, that's almost all of it. Anyway, 49.94, that's real nice. Facebook followers, I've got 30, I've crossed 3,400, I got 3,401. And YouTube subscribers, there's a lot more than that. There's 20,412. And this number moves like a very slow a, a gasoline pump. But the YouTube views an hour and a half ago when I extracted them to type them up here, I, on my channel, on my University Motors YouTube channel, we've got 9,000,000. 38,363 views. So thank you, thank everybody. Because every time, every time somebody watches one of those, I don't know, I get a hundredth of a cent or something or other. But nine million times anything is something. So thank you very, very kindly. I, I appreciate that very much. I want to go through and publicly thank the people who have donated since the last seminar. Um, it's very kind. David Massey from Florida, Tom Starkweather from Michigan, Ken Rosenberg, Nevada, Bill Fisher, New Jersey, Charlie Foy from Louisiana, Bill Rosefear from Indiana, Doug Miller, Ohio, Les Bengtson, Arizona. Uh, um, I've got Gwen Mitchell, Texas, Doug Wolfire, Washington, D.C., Doug Clark, Illinois. Thanks, Doug. Doug's our unofficial official counter tonight and said he was going to wear his pith helmet. I was going to get mine out so we could go fifth to fifth. Um, Kurt Johnson, Pennsylvania, Fred Lessicar, California, Tom Capehart, but he doesn't say where he's from, Daniel Eastman, Wisconsin, Nathan Dickerson from New Mexico, John Danley from Maryland, Rodolfo Cortez from Monterey, Mexico, I hope he's on tonight, David Vincent from Unknown Places, Gary Martin, Ohio, Ed Cook from Everything and Spares, uh, Mel Shotton from Ohio, Sandy Brainski from Connecticut, Dave Cray from Parts Unknown, Alan Divorcey from South Carolina, Dan McGovern from down south, Bobo Tanner from Tennessee, Otmar Rankin, Elizabeth Arnold from Virginia, Dean Wheeler from Kansas, Dave Smittle, Ohio, Skip and Susan from Washington, James Nybert, from Columbus, Ohio. Um, I, if I'd known you were there, I would have stopped by and said hello to you too. John Uhas from Connecticut. So thank you everyone for, for uh, donating. It makes it very, very nice. I do get bills, I have bills. I, I joke about it, but it really is true. I have to pay insurance to do this. So I guess if you take my advice and it ain't right, or you do it wrong, or I've given you the bad, or whatever, you know, and someone, someone gets a lawyer, you know, so there's some, some um, backup. So anyway, that's the scoop for tonight. And I'm hoping that Kent Prather has been able to come on. So Kent, if, if you're on, can you unmute yourself? Kent? But there's no unmuting and there's no Kent. So um, not yet, but as soon as Kent comes on, we'll, we'll go for it. Um, sometimes getting, uh, getting on is a, is a bizarre thing. Um, so I'm just going to start hitting the chats now from James, James, um, December Lily, you've got a GT, James, you, you got that, uh, 
Um, you want to unmute yourself? You must be on. James of the GT, who used the gal here in Grand Rapids for the. Um... Yes. Good evening, John. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. So you got a you got the decal badge for the rear hatch of the GT. I put that out uh, a couple of months ago or something or other when I did got that done for my daughter's car. It was so easy to go from BGT to BRT. So, um, however, I need need the black octagon of the MG inside is mine is delaminated. Her replacement decal works just fine. Um, so anyway, this is Jim saying that he thinks 25 bucks for the decal is is a better deal than 90 bucks for a, another motif or questionable um, quality. So, so what do you got behind you in your picture there? Or is that your actual? Uh, Jim? That's the that's the BGT in question. Uh, that one is a factory V8, John. Oh, nice right hand drive or. Yes, yes. And uh, the one over my other shoulder is a uh, Caterham 7. Okay, what's that got for a power plant? Uh, it's got the uh, 1600cc uh, Ford Focus motor in it. It looks like... Uh, however, it's a lot of fun. Uh, Caterham has uh, tweaked the engine management package a bit, so it goes pretty well. It, it looks like it weighs about 900 pounds. <laughs> Not much. Not much at all. Okay. Well, anyway, thank you very, very kindly for um, for those of you. December Lily. I don't know. Is that an AOL or something like that? I, I don't even remember. But if, if uh, she makes these decals to go on the inside of the rear motif on the BGT. So just something. She usually does jewelry. Actually, the stories, I probably told this last time, I went in the body shop and, and I was looking for stencils. I didn't know what I was going to do. I just didn't want to pay 90 bucks for a brand new motif. And uh, Nick at the body shop says, well, you know, Buddy's wife or whoever it is, um, has, has a cricket. I said, a cricket? Like a 1975 Plymouth cricket? which is a rebadged Hillman Avenger. He said, what? And I said, what? But it turns out Cricket is some, some device or software package. Anyway, if you want to have this woman, December Lily, make an insert for your BGT and you lost it, you can't find it online or, or anywhere, just get in touch with me and I'll, I'll forward her email address to you. All right, for Larry Sears. Uh, hi, could you discuss replacement of the scroll seal at the rear of the crankshaft with a real rubber seal? Okay, so Lawrence Sears, unmute yourself. I've got to ask too, is Kent Prather on yet? Kent, are you, are you someplace here out in the ether? But no, uh, anyway, Mr. Sears, are you here? I am. Okay. All right. So what year and model do you have? It's a 57 and I've got a 1600 engine in it. Okay. So my, ex there are a couple routes to go. One is to have the bottom end of the engine, a line board, A-L-I-G-N, a line board. And the, the rear, uh, the slinger has to, has to match the scroll thread on the crank. If you do that, and if it's a good job, you're down to an, an occasional drip, the, the drip that all MGs have, Wait, no matter I, what you do. I, I'm sorry, could you, could, you, uh, could you explain that again? Uh, do you, what are you, what are you changing? I mean, the, the engine is obviously already bored, so. So the, en the engine is, is totally apart, totally right. apart. And they take the, the main caps off. Yes sand them so now right. it's no, no longer a hole but it, it's it's less of a hole right it's over and a little bit put a boring bar through through there and open it back up so it's a straight line yeah in line with the cylinders etc cetera, etc cetera. but the scroll thread on the back of the crank they yeah. they attend to that and make sure that it's round because sometimes they become 
elliptic also, right. make it round, and then they make the rear cap, the slinger on the rear cap, fit maybe two thousandths of an inch away from that scroll thread. And uh -huh. when, when you do that, the scroll thread will screw the oil back into the engine. All right, so you're just making sure you've got a very small gap between the OD of the, of the, of the scroll thread and the, the, the back bearing. Okay. Correct. Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. And those, those figures are available. If they're not on Barney's site, Barney's almost always on. Mm -hmm. um, um, but if, um, if, it, if that isn't on Barney's site, I've got the specs here too. I still have four or five people. I haven't sent that engine information out to. I'm sorry. I will do it soon. Um, but I, but you can, you can, um, send me a note and, and I'll do my best to, to, get, to get you those specs too. Now there are a couple of aftermarket seals, a couple of aftermarket um, ways that you can, you can slow down that seal, or that, that uh, get rid of that leak and make it more like an MGB. Uh -huh. um, but my experience is that they're all expensive or complicated or both. Now, Kent Prather has one, and I, I'm uh, waiting for Kent to come on, and then he could talk to you. If you go on his site, Prather Racing, he's got a seal that's available. Uh -huh. There's got to be something available in England, but I don't know wh what it is. So my suggestion is for an aftermarket seal, go to Barney's, Barney Gaylord's MGA Guru site and see what he's got there. Um, is there any way to practically tell, you know, how bad it is? You just try to gauge how bad the leak is after you, because well, it will only leak when you turn it off, when you stop the engine, right? Well, when you lose a vacuum? Um, no, it's not that. It's just all the oil has been spun up onto the, because of the action of the um, flywheel, the centrifugal nature of spinning all that air out there, mm -hmm. it swings the oil all around the inside of the bell housing. And then it it's, drifts out. Okay. And then when you turn it off, it all comes out the, the split pin, the okay. powder pin that's down there exactly for that reason. So that hole doesn't get plugged up. Right. Okay. So, so it's just you, a matter of how much oil you lose, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Did it ever and, work? And, <laughs> After you know, after after a heavy duty run, you know, with a with a slinger in place, you're gonna get an oil spot. I, you know, I mean, you know, you're gonna get an oil spot. No matter how no matter how perfect you make that slinger, you're gonna always have an oil spot. Okay. Um, but I know that there's a lot of you've got to be very skilled. I think you do um, yeah. to fit these other uh, systems in place. So yeah, you want to do the line that. boring is pretty significant too. Well, line boring is another hundred, hundred bucks, hundred and fifty bucks. You know, just got to make sure that they match your block to your crank. Right, right. Okay. One last question: When you rebuild an engine, do you always do that? As always. a matter of course. Always. always. Unless, unless it's a five main B or, or you know, something with a rear seal, but. All the T types, all the midgets, not the midget 1500s, uh, all the A series engine midgets, and uh, all the MGAs and MGBs until the introduction of the five main engine all have that rear, rear seal. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, we got user. I've tried over a few seasons to join chat and can't. So I don't know. I don't know. There's a there's a toolbar on the bottom. If you go on the bottom, you click on chat. Um, quite frankly, I'm not sure how you um because I I'm always talking and I'm not chatting, so I'm not exactly sure. Maybe somebody else knows you can step in. So oh, and Dave Stein. <laughs> Set, who is responding to the letter that I sent before. Uh, he says, hi, John, I'm away from my microphone, but thanks for telling the story. Um, I'll keep looking for that, that letter too. That would be fun to see. Okay, so now we've got a note from Jim Holiday from London, Ontario. Jim, are you on? Kent Prater, are you on? I keep looking for Kent. We're hoping that Kent can come on. 
So. Hey, John. How you doing? Hey, Jim. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Great. Uh, about six weeks ago, I think you talked, we were talking about, uh, someone was talking about compression ratio and, and um, oh, shaving right. the head. And you, you stated a, a, a number, a, 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 a ratio rule. number. Yeah. And that was so, a rule of thumb for, um, you know, when, when you start to increase it, it's not linear because you can't take your compression to 500 to one and get a million horsepower. So, um, you, you know, you, you lose your ability to run the engine eventually. Oh, come on, Carl Heidemann has it. Was it, was it five horsepower for every half point of compression? I don't know, I haven't got Carl's stuff in front of me and if I had to go look for it, you know, it'd be five minutes before I got back, so I can't. But Jim, I'll look for that for you. Let me make a note about that and, um, does he, yeah, Carl, Carl had that from his many, I mean, Carl did, Carl Heidemann, Eclectic Motor Works, Holland, Michigan. He sells a, a little book, I believe he does, about engine, about engines and his experiences with them. The, the reason why I asked the question tonight is because with uh, uh, Kent Prather coming on, you know, he builds those high horsepower engines and and actually, in the paddock, when you when you hear an engine, one of his engines, they're almost uh, it's almost painful the sound of the uh, the exhaust note on it, and you could tell, you know, he's got that compression crank cranked up to 12, 12 to one or more, you know, as high as maybe fourteen. I'm and, hoping I'm hoping he's able to get on, and 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 he can he can help answer that because and ru rumors have it that they get up to like 140 horsepower with with you know 12 13 14 to 1 maybe even more horsepower um i know i know that a stock mgb when you put it on the dynamometer and and find the point where it's got the highest uh, horsepower on a well-tuned MGB, the most you're gonna get is around 60, 62 at the rear wheels. So it's, you know, I threw the clutch, through the gearbox, through the drive shaft, through all everything else. And, and this is on a accelerating type of dynamometer. So Carl's done, I don't know, 1,200, 1,500 pulls on, on the dyno over Baker Engineering in the Grand Haven. And it's, it's, um, it's a, you know, the proof is in the pudding. And, and I know we did one one time, just a stock carbureted engine, and we got it up to 75 at the rear wheels. I have no idea what it is at the engine. What difference does it make? It made, makes a difference what it is at the rear wheels. And um, that's when I discovered timing was so critical because we had this guy come from Hershey, Pennsylvania for our tuning for speed class. And mm -hmm. before, we, before I changed his timing, which was the first day, which was a complete tune-up, is if you want to extract as much power out of, your, out of your engine as possible, the first thing to do is tune it, because that's almost free. Just make it run right and see, see if you like it there, and then start adding the stuff. That's John, uh, John yeah. I got Carl's book in front of me. Oh, okay. It is roughly uh, one horsepower for every tenth compression point. One so, horsepower for a tenth of a point. Yeah, for, for so, instance, at, so at ten uh, horsepower per point. Yeah, at sixty-five hundred, the eight to one is sixty-seven. At sixty-five hundred, the nine point five is eighty-two. So okay. one point five points got him fifteen horsepower. Okay, so Jim, there's there's an answer, but but you. you're talking about out on the track, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that that's a that's a whole other set of rules. But before, before, thank you, Max. That's very very kind. Where where are you from, Max? Uh, now Durham, North Carolina. You were from Kalamazoo. Uh, I was from Mount Pleasant. Right. I okay. Pleasure. You, you're, you still there? At, um, what's the firm? Flying Circus. Yes, Flying Circus. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay. So back to what? 
back to my thought a couple of thoughts ago. Um, this guy had driven here and, and he'd driven all the way here with his timing at 27 before top dead center. And we reset it to 32, we put it on the dyno, we get 62 horsepower on the dyno at 32 um, degrees before maximum. We moved it back to 27 and we lost five horsepower. So the first thing you always do when you're trying to get power out of your engine is tune it correctly. You know, that's the first thing. Then you start getting excited about different cams and heads and compression ratios and everything. So, and I'm still calling for Kent. Kent, are you around? We got 204 people. We got people waiting to, to, to be introduced to, to Kent. So, all right. So we got the, it's um, 10 horsepower per point. Okay, from Joe Mick. I have a 78 MGB. I really like the car. It's developed a leak in the, in the, in the steering rack. Uh, looks like the pinion seal. Do you have to take the rack out to change the seal? And how do you keep the steering wheel aligned? Well, let's see. The questions are, do you have to take the rack out to change the seal? No. Okay. That's easy. So you have to undo the, the top pack off the rack and pinion, the shim pack, take that out. There's a big plunger in there, take him all out. You've got to take the front of the rack and pinion off. You got to take the transverse bolt off the U-joint and then horror, horror, but how else are you going to do it? You grab the, you grab the steering shaft, which is hardened. So that's a very hard piece of steel with two pairs of vice grips clamp as tightly as you can right next to each other and then strike the top one with a hammer, tunk, 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 and drive that pinion out of the rack and pinion. Once it's out, then you go ahead and spin the pinion somehow. I don't know, figure it out. I've got to, I've got to lay it so it's easy, but you got to use something that at, at worst, you're just going to take sandpaper and run it up and down and up and down and wherever you scarred it or wherever it has been scarred or rusted or paint built up, you make them smooth. Make them as smooth as you can. How are you? You replace the seal in the rack. That's a 5754 Chicago Rawhide seal. Don't, don't quote me on that, but Moss has it. So you pop the old one out, put, put the new one in and then grease it, grease it up a lot, grease up the pinion, push the pinion through it, get it, put it back into the U-joint any way you want because you cannot get it aligned. You can't, so don't even try. Okay. Don't even try. And then- Hey John, mute everybody, we got back talk. Okay. Oh, look at that. Joe, you're gonna have to come come back on. Uh, so just Joe, go, go ahead and un Unmute yourself. There, okay, there I am. Yeah. Okay, so you change the seal and then you put that rack, grease it, grease it, grease it. Put that rack back up through the, the rack and pinion and tighten it all up, oil it, take the top shim pack off and introduce the 90 weight um, gear oil in there. And if you've seen my video on YouTube, it's real messy. It's like, oh, isn't there a better way to do this? Sure, measure it, put it in a, then how are you going to get it in there? I don't know, I just poured it until and like the YouTube video shows is you're rolling the wheel back and forth and back and forth. It finally gets to the point where you're burping out as much fluid as you're putting in. So at that point, stop. Um, then you've got to pop the steering wheel off. That's my number one video. That's why I started making videos on YouTube um, was because somebody called me for the third time that same week and asked, how do I take my steering wheel off? So watch my YouTube video, do that, and realign your steering wheel. Because it may be just like this, and it may be upside, you know, who knows? And it, you can't get it aligned again. There's too many splines on that on that U-joint. So does that make sense? Absolutely, John. Thank you very much. Uh, big sure. fan, your wealth of information. Thank you for everything you do. Hey, you're welcome. Go to my U. Go to my, my go to my page and press the PayPal button. Thank you. Bend it. Bend it. Well Joe, worth it. Thanks.
Okay, so now we're down. We're still looking for Kent. Kent, when you come on, you unmute yourself and just come on. JBW, how do we get on the email list? Well, there's two ways. You can either send me an email that's more laborious and may not work quite as well, or you go on my website just underneath that PayPal button. And there's a, there's a little thing on the top ribbon that says, join our newsletter. And you join our newsletter and you put in your email address and your name and then, you're, then you get all the constant contact uh, things that I, I send out. So, all right. Um, <laughs> I've got Ryan, Ryan Massfeller. Ryan, are, are you on right now? Are you, you, uh, you here? We got 203 people on. So yeah, Ryan, I'm here, John. Hey, great. Okay. Well, Ryan, yeah, Ryan, uh, all of us at 1 million of those 9 million views are from him alone. So thank you. <laughs> That's funny. You have the good work. Thanks. Dale Brown. Um, so Dale, you, you can unmute yourself and we will continue with your problem, which is a 72B with HIFs. The front damper, the AUC 8114, the plastic damper, sometimes pops off. I can tell that immediately because the engine starts to run rough. I open the hood, he opens the bonnet really, screws it back in and everything's okay until it pops out again. Okay, so they should be in the same place. And are, are you on, Dale? Yeah, I am. Yeah, okay. Can you so, hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, you can take that out and you can look at it. It's got a black plastic washer on it. Yep. Just take the plastic washer off. Oh. Then it, it'll grab a couple of more threads. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's as easy as that. You can buy a new one, but why? If you yeah. want to buy a new one, because you don't want to take them off, because it's important to you that they're both plunged into the dash pots the same yeah. distance. I can't for the life of me think what difference that would make. But if your buddy who races uh, races cars says that's important, then contact Paul Deershaw at Sports Car Craftsman in Arvada, Colorado. And Paul's got a, a million used parts and buy a new one too. So. Well, so do I. And, and my brother has a 74, early 74, and he has the same problem. So I'll tell him. I'll tell him to try that too. <laughs> that's a bizarre thread. That's a, I think that's 11 16th 26. It just, it doesn't even show up in the, in the, in the big, in the big machinery handbooks. And it's just, it's not yeah. quite a proprietary thread, but it's a, it's a I, brass thread. I've even I, tried yeah. plumber's Teflon tape on it, but that didn't work. <laughs> well, the force, when you put the, when you put that damper in there, you know, you put the oil in, you screw yes. the damper on the top, and you put your thumb underneath that piston, and someone says, push that piston up as fast as you can. I'll give you 100 bucks if you can push it up in one second. You cannot make that 100 bucks. No. That's really <laughs> hard. That's really hard to press that piston upwards. Yeah. So, and what's restricting it is just that little damper. Yeah. So there's a lot okay. of force on those threads. I'll try that. But, Thanks a lot, John. John, on my... Uh, TD was twin SU, uh, uh, the standard yeah. TD carburetor. After a hard run, now I, I've redone a lot of things on it, but when I first had it, after a hard run, I would notice that both of the dampers had unscrewed, and I never could figure out what it was that caused it. But if I did like a drive through the mountains where I was pushing it pretty hard, all of a sudden, they they both. When I got back to the shop, and you know, I'm checking to see everything. So, do you have any idea what the cause is? It is a is it it's the same, flow? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's that upward pressure on those pistons. It isn't. It probably hasn't pulled the threads out. Probably not that. But yours are hexagonal, or you're. Oh, you, were round brass. Okay. Well, as horrible as this sounds take a pair of real pliers and grab it and snug it just a little tiny bit. Tighten the crap out of it. Okay, yeah, thank you. That's, <laughs> the, that's the size of it. I, I want to introduce everyone here to Norm Ewing. Norm, can you can you come on, you unmute yourself here? 
Can't believe there is one. Okay. Oh, I see. Because your 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 uh, picture's on one frame and the voice is on the other. So tell us tell us where where you're from, Norman. Oh, you're muted again. So keep working, keep talking to me, and I'll tell you when we can hear you, because I can't hear you yet. Can you hear me yet? Yes. Okay, I'm from Johannesburg, South Africa. So Norman ran the MG Club in South Africa for what, the last 83 years, about? Yeah, still doing it. <laughs> so welcome. Welcome. And, so, and, and being Cecil Kimber's birthday today, I got my J2 running today. Very nice. That's a good day. How long have you owned your J2? Well, I've had it since, uh, it's taken me 44 years just to get the damn thing running. Ah, so too I started, bad. Yeah, I started too bad. Yeah, down there. Yeah. 76, I started with a chassis. <laughs> oh my gosh. But I've had I have had my MGA since 1964, and I will never part with that car, never. So it runs well. Um, I've, I also have a little 160, the new little, the last of the, the breed out of out of out of England, and then Pat's got a little ZR run around, and I've got a 54 TF1250 as well. So they keep me busy. Very nice, very nice. Norman's been trying to come on for the last, on and off for the last sure. three months, I think. So yep. glad you're here tonight. Well, we've, got electricity. we've got electricity tonight, that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, good luck with that. But great to see all you guys, really. Hey, you know, this. We had, um, oh, I don't know, Ron Gammons, someone in our summer party so many years ago. And he said, it's the mark of friendship. Absolutely. It doesn't matter whether you go to Johannesburg or Sri Lanka or Hong Kong or, or Auckland, New Zealand. There, there, are, there are MG owners everywhere. Yeah, that's great. It's a family. It's a family. And if it hey, wasn't for hey, COVID, we wouldn't be doing this. So that's Very what's true. great. Can you hear Kent Prather by any chance? Kent, you're here. Yes, yes. Good, good. Okay. So I've been I've been on since the very beginning listening, but I didn't know you had to press star six. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. You know, go figure how it works anyway. You know. So. Hey, I know all about engines. I just don't know about these Zoom calls. Okay. All right. Well, so. Um, <clears throat> All right, so the first question, well, Kent, t tell us about yourself. T tell us what you do and, you know, building engines and racing MGs and so forth. Well, you can ask Jim Holiday. That's because I'm retired. So um, actually, I'm actually working on my college MGA that I bought in 1969. And... Um, I mean, I graduated from Kansas State University and started a business, and then I started racing in 1979. You don't want to hear everything about me, but I have won eight national championships and built a really good MGA engine. Hey, man. Yep. Jim, Jim, can, uh, Jim Holiday can, can attest to, to that. And, and Kent knows more about the MGA twin cam engines than anyone on this continent, at least. Is, isn't that, that's gotta be correct, isn't it? Um, I uh, doubt that, but I, I have built quite a few of them. So um, in the Norm Decker um, award that you get when you win at Watkins Glen, um, every single MGA motor on that trophy belongs to my, to my shop, except for Jim Holiday's twin cam. Okay. All right. So anyway, what kind of questions? What kind of questions have you got for me? Well, the first one up here is what is Ken Prather's seal solution for a three main engine? Well, um, I make a kit, and the biggest the biggest thing was 
manufacturing the sleeve. So the biggest problem with the MGA motor is the line bore, as I heard you mention earlier. So if you have a motor that's that's not line bored properly or um, got excessive line boring from the machine shop, then what happens is the seal is not really centered in the block. So um, this is a kit that the seal bolts to the rear plate. So once you install the sleeve on the back of the crank, you then install the the seal on the on the rear plate and you kind of just scribe it and then you you drill your four holes to secure it and it 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 fits on the crank perfectly concentric because you have put it on there concentric. Um, anybody that's really interested in this kit, I send out uh, the information sheet on exactly how to do it. It's not really complicated. The two complicated things to this were making the sleeve and machining the seal because you have to use a standard lip seal and you have to cut it flat so that you can, you know, get it to go on. So those two things are done for you in the kit. But it's, I've tried reverse installing seals. I've tried all kinds of things and this is really the only seal that actually does work on an MGA. Can you give us your contact information? Um, PrayThroughRacing.com has all my contact information. All right. How you my website is, is old. Prather with a P. Mm -hmm. uh, P R A T H E R. Okay. PrayThroughRacing.com. Got, Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Kent, this would work on on all all the three main B, B series engines. 1500 or or uh, 1800 MGB. Yes. Every single three main MGB motor to work on. So is there is there one for a, for a, a midget engine like that that you know of? There is a 1275 steel kit. Yes. Where does that come from? Moss Motor sells that one. Okay. The only thing I don't like about the 1275 seal kit is that, as you know, the the back flange of the let's not call it the flange, we'll call it the registry of the crank, is not really flat. It's not straight. It's you know, it's got an angle to it. So what it tries to do is continually push the seal back off. So you have to make sure you really clamp it down and um, and glue it in there so it can't move. That's but that is a good seal kit also. Excellent. Kent, you mentioned uh, a simpler solution at one of your meetings uh, was uh, like an O-ring, some, some kind of flat washer or something that you also sell. That is not the best, but you said you had pretty good results with it. Well, in the beginning, um, I tried an O-ring between the rear of the crank and the block. Okay, there's a little spot there. So you have your you have your slinger, then you have your scroll, and then you have the distance that the crank sticks, you know, through the rear cap. So before you put the rear plate on, and actually before you put the rear cap on, you can put a number 226 seal. It's an O-ring is what it is. And so I use the red seal, which is which is a Viton. And and it will slow it down quite a bit. So that fills the gap. So what happens is the oil really can't get out in the back of the crank. But it's not a positive seal, it's just an O-ring. So Max Fulton has a question for uh, for Kent too about about uh, cracked blocks and cracked cranks and 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 dampers. What, what, so Max, you want to unmute yourself and you can talk straight up to Kent. Hey Kent, we met once Gold Cup BIR, I don't know, two thousand nine. Oh, okay, Max. Good to see you again. And then I said hello to you in the grandstands, and I said, why aren't you in your car? And you said, Jesse's driving. 
Yeah, occasionally, if you want to know how fast your car can go, you let your son drive it. Right. Uh, yeah, so my question was, uh, we've actually had a couple of cracked cranks over the years and cracked blocks. And strangely, the bearing problem is always like, say, on number four, but the crack will be found in the block number two. And I'm wondering, have, with all of the engines you've done, whereas we've only done a few race engines, if you found a reason for why that happens, and then the corollary question is, what do you recommend running for a crank damper? Well, you've hit, the, you've hit it right on the nose. So what you have is a harmonic resonance in the engine that causes those to crack. And so um, the damper, we can get to that in a minute, but the damper is only part of the solution. The flywheel is the biggest part of the solution. And what I've found is that most cracked cranks or blocks are caused from aluminum flywheels. We are running a steel one piece we got from England, I forget who, but it runs the seven and a quarter inch Tilton. Well, you, that's going to be good because that, that flywheel probably only weighs nine to 11 pounds yeah, and you and need nine and a half. So you need a little bit of that weight to help in your, in your damping. Um, I mean, I've gone crazy on dampers when you, I run very high compression. Um, the current engine that I have in my car runs 14A to 1. And you have to have a really good damper. So, so I put an ATI damper on. It's a 7-inch Chevy damper. And there's a hub that, that actually um, ATI makes for me that you can install. But the Romac damper does a pretty good job, too. The other thing is, are you micro balancing? Uh, to what level do you refer to as micro balancing? Micro balancing is zero. Uh, we're balancing to so about you, a gram. Gram, gram, yeah. yeah, you got to you got to balance to zero, unfortunately. So um, what happens is there's charts that you can see. CMT Crank Balancing Company puts out a chart that tells you how much an out of balance happens every 100 RPM after about 5,000 RPM. And the poundage um, on an out of balance crank is amazing. So the other thing is, have you ever take, taken your MGB crank and, and checked it for bend, bend and twist? Um, I, it was when it was, uh, you know, cross drilled and, and all that stuff. Yes. Um, I don't think we bothered to check it again after that. Okay, so you actually have to put it on a couple of, of um, V blocks and use a dial indicator on the center main and yep. then a dial indicator on the front main to check it. So you have to have a, a perfectly straight crank and you have to have it perfectly balanced. Now, I, I can tell you what's happening in your balancing. What happens to guys is, you know, you want to take the weight off the counterweights. So you get down to that ounce, ounce and a half. And what's happened to you is now all of a sudden it wants you to take weight in between the counterweights and there's no place to take weight out. So what you have to do is you have to take one of the counterbalances. Let's say you're, it's in the front of the crank that you're out of balance and your, your, your counterweights are totally flat. You've got to drill one of the counterweights until you become out of balance to throw the weight over to the next counterweight so that you can drill that counterweight to get the weight out of it to get to zero. Did you understand that? Uh, I think so. It's a matter of spending the time on the crank balancer to really get it right. Now you, you can do PraetherRacing.com and send me an email and I'll tell you all about it, but, but crankshaft balancing is everything. Okay. And of course, balancing rods is easy to do and balancing pistons and wrist pins and rings and all that's easy to do. But if you do all that and you use the flywheel that you've got, you'll probably be just fine with a Romac damper. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're running basically an old copy of the original damper. It's, you know, it's just the normal size, normal rubber. Um, and we've been running that for years, but we noticed that as the revs went up and the horsepower went up, 
um, though the compression didn't go up, we're still at 12.5. Um, we started having more issues of uh, engines didn't seem to last as long. And I started thinking that maybe it was a harmonic because we're now over seven grand where we used not to be. Yeah, and then actually you don't really need to use much more than about 7,200. Then once upon a time we did a, a dyno session one winter and um, I was being really concerned about vibrations in engines. So I did a really scientific thing I, I took a, um, a plastic bucket and I duct taped it to my dyno stand. It was very professional. And at 7,000 at 7, RPM, it would throw every bit of water out of that bucket. Right. So we started working on it and we started doing things in balancing. And we started doing things in flywheels and dampers until you could run 7,500 RPM and there wouldn't be any vibration at all. So then we found that actually there is a harmonic that we couldn't get out, and that was between 7,200 and 7,500. So you either run less than 7,200 or you go all the way to 7,800. Yeah, we're, we're trying to do the run less than 7,200. So in fact, okay. we have to drop the gearing back to 3.9 just to bring the revs back down below seven grand. Yeah, I like to shift to 7,000. Okay. Thank you, Kent. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Well, now, Kent, the um, Judd's got a, a question for you, which is, I think I know the answer to this one. I don't know all these machine machining questions, but I think I know the answer to this. So, Judd, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and talk to Kent. I think this is me. Uh, not, not all of us race. We like to drive uh, spiritedly on the street. What what are the fundamental difference? Uh, do you only build race engines, or do you also build street engines? And if so, what are the fundamental differences that one would do if building a street engine versus a race engine? Well, um, you're building a well. Let's call it a hot rod street engine because um, that's what you're doing: spirited race, spirited street driving. Right. So. There isn't much difference between a racing engine and a spirited street engine, with the exception of camshaft, carburetors, and compression. Now, you know that you're not going to make any big race horsepower without porting and polishing the head. So that's another part of the equation. But all these engines need to be sure that the line bore is correct, make sure the balance is right, make sure you're building four one-cylinder engines. If everything's in harmonics, you're going to be just fine. So if you want to put a stage two or a stage three cam in it, you can do that. If you want to do a little bit of work on the short radius of the head, you can do that. But you really just need to pay attention to the details and, and um, try to just make sure that it's as as you know as as even as possible in all all the work that you do. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Ken, I had a guy contact me today and wondered whether he should take his 60 over, this is an MGB, just an MGB street engine. He said, okay. should, I take a, should I take my 60 over block and have it resleeved, or should I just get another block? I told him that in either case, he's going to have to get, have cam bearings, because why not do cam bearings? So I told him to choose the least, the, the lesser of the, of the two expenses. What would you say? Well, the problem with sleeving is that now the 1800 has a big enough bore that the head gasket will hold the sleeve in. So if you have a machine shop that knows to leave a step at the bottom of the block, so that the sleeve goes in and then it gets milled at the top. So you have this thin sleeve that's held in by the head gasket, you're okay. The problem is the 1600, I mean, they don't make a really good 1600 gasket. So you have to use an 1800 gasket. And if you do that, there's nothing that holds the sleeve in. So I think sleeving is risky depending on the availability of a block. Um, getting to cam bearings, 
Cam bearings control the oil pressure in these engines almost as much as anything. The center center cam bearing doesn't matter if it's a three main or a five main. There's only three cam bearings. The center cam bearing wears out pretty quickly, and you lose a lot of oil there, which controls your oil pressure. So either way, I mean that's a personal decision as to which way to go. I'd say if he can find a good virgin block and do all the steps that you need to do he'd be better off. Makes sense. Well, he's at 60,000. He can go bigger than 60,000. But, you know, if he's already had to do that, that means that the block's already got quite a bit of time on it. If he could find another block, that'd be the way to go. Okay. That's... That would probably be the lesser of the two expenses anyway. So yes. So how many how many how many engines do you figure you've built? Well, I started building racing engines. I started building racing engines in 1979. So as far as MG motors, I've built thousands of MG motors. I probably I've probably built. 5,000 Volkswagen engines because I did those before I started on MGs. I started I started doing Volkswagen engines in 1969. But you know, getting back to that, racing engines. I've just built a lot of them, that's for sure. And some customers need to have two or three of them, you know. <laughs> I wish you had done one more. <laughs> <laughs> so well, so, um, so you don't you don't do. Um, you don't do any more engine building except under extreme protest, I guess. And but you do have you do have parts and stuff for sale on on your website. I do, and I pretty much have everything a guy would need. And if the guy if I don't have it, I know where to source the proper the proper things. Um, I do have certain customers that will come to the shop with their block and with their crank and spend the day doing special oiling modifications and doing different things just because I I still like I'd still like everybody to know how to do these good engines but I I'm really kind of trying to do my own thing right now I'm actually trying to restore the my second MGA that I bought in 1969 drove it all through college took it apart and 79, that's when I started racing, so that car really needs to be put back together. Lots of us share that same story. <laughs> yeah. Well, does anyone what else, else have, have a question about, uh, about engines? Uh, I do. Bob, Cook, Bob and Gloria Cook, uh, first thing, uh, Kent, we really miss you at uh, Mid Ohio. Uh, we used to watch you all the time. And uh, question I have: You mentioned 60, 000, 60 over. My engine was two years ago was bored sixty over because the cylinder walls were tenting. They had a forty thousand four. And uh, you, you mentioned you can go bigger than sixty. I know there's a lot of meat in there, but where would you get pistons if you went bigger than sixty? Um, you can have custom pistons made from JE or you know, Molly makes them. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of places that'll make you a forged um, fist piston. So, you know, you're going to buy cast pistons for what four hundred dollars. So, a set of forged pistons are going to be six hundred dollars. Uh huh. Okay. So well, I want to keep my safe. Of, well, the, and the beauty of that is, um, you can have your machine shop tell you how much wear there is. It can do a little honing. You might get away with. 65 over you don't necessarily have to go to 70 or 75 over mm -hmm. and i and i don't have any problem boring these motors up to a hundred thousands wow when That's you go right. over when you go over a hundred thousands you're starting to get too thin and you're not going to cool properly so you could go 65 or 70 thousands and not worry about it well my my engine's got 489 thousand miles on it it's probably 589 because I bought it with 40, tore it down at 187. It had already been bored out 40,000. So, but I don't count that. I just count that what I know. 
and I just want to keep that block. I mean, it's numbers matching and uh, my car's been in uh, all over the country and we're not afraid to take it anywhere. But I just worry that one, it's only going to go around so many times. Well, I think you can save it easily, easy enough. If you want to get in touch with me and um, I'll be glad to send you one of my piston sheets that, that tells you what you need to do to order the proper piston from one of these piston manufacturers. Um, a tip that I'll give you is that I always get the rings first. So I'm kind of partial to total seal rings. Uh -huh. And so I call, I call total seal and I say, okay, I want to bore this thing uh, three inches, 265 thousandths. And they'll go, well, okay, nope. I, I don't have it at 65, but I have it at 63. And I say, fine. So I get the rings and then I put that on the piston sheet and I have the custom piston guy make it and um, I use those rings and that 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 keeps your your block going around and around just like you want. It's, cool. it's good to know. We're taking notes here. Uh, well, I got another question. Uh, the Kansas City uh, MG Club, are they uh, they canceled the show again this year, the one in uh, June? I don't see anything and on what there. No, and they haven't decided on that yet. And I think it's a little late to decide. So yeah. I think I think it's probably not going to happen. It's just, it's kind of a shame that the Topeka British Car Club is doing a few things, but um, everybody's still a little COVID afraid. Yeah, yeah, we are too. <laughs> Got my second shot, but still, not everybody has. Uh, we right. did away with the, the June show uh, a few years ago, and... Uh, when we just do the uh, September show and we're still planning to do that as far as I know. In, in September, that's the one in Kansas City? Yes, it is. Okay, because we, we've been to that a number of times. So we're from Cleveland, Ohio, but we don't have a problem driving across the country to go to a car show and see whatever it is in between. All right. And I've seen you there. Yeah, we've, we saw you though. 2018 was the last time we saw you yep. there. I think I've, I think I've seen you at, at multiple car shows here. Okay. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, we, we always seem to run into you. Uh, it, always enjoy right. it. And I just, I miss you uh, driving at, at mid Ohio. And that, that little MGA was, uh, that was really, I heard um, a couple of guys talking about your car and, and he said, that's the widest MG I've ever seen. I can't pass them. <laughs> so. Bob? Yeah. If, if you're in Cleveland, we're, uh, I'm in Waterville. We have a show, uh, Lake River Car Club has a show in Perrysburg on June 6th. We're going, to try to give it a, we're going to try to give it a go this year. So if you get a chance, uh, come, and, come and join us. Okay, we'll do that. Perrysville, okay. We're at, we're at Fort Meigs, so you get oh, yeah. the tour of the fort. Yeah. I was there a few years ago, we went. And okay. I haven't been there since, but it, it just it, it, we'll it conflicted it. with some other stuff I was doing. But yeah, it was a nice setup. Well, thank you. All right, we got a question here from David to Ken. How many miles will a well-maintained MGB five main bearing engine last before a rebuild? Well, you know, we used to work on commuter cars back in 75, and it's all a matter of how you take care of it. Um, it seems to me that your wear items are your valve guides, and your rings. Nowadays, you got to worry about the bearing, so you just have to make sure you use a really good tri-metal bearing. If it's all done right, I don't see any reason why you can't get a hundred thousand out of it before you're going to have sufficient wear in the in the in the guides, you know, to warrant a, to taking it apart. The thing about MG motors is they really will go and go and go depending on what you do. So if you adjust the valves a lot and you change the oil a lot. I don't, I, it'd be, I'd be shocked how many miles you could really get on it. But we used to always say back in the day that 60,000, 75,000, it was time to do a valve job. Okay. All right. Now let's see from iPad. I'm not sure who iPad is, but you can identify yourself or unmute yourself here. Ken, can you please describe what is referred to as a D9, Delta 9 cam grind? I have one and a pair of inch and three quarter SUs on the shelf. 
Is there any point in putting those on a stock 79B head? Uh, 30, uh, he's, this guy's got a 37,000 um, kilometer, no, 30, I'm sorry, 37,000 mile, a really nice uh, car. And um, he, the go fast parts that he has, which is the cam and the carbs, came from a car that he uh, he's already retired. So the question is, does it make any sense to put these parts on his existing car? Well, you know, putting a camshaft in is a big deal. You have to make sure that you've got the proper spring springs, you know, you have to make sure everything is right. Um, has he considered putting a higher lift rocker set on it? Well, that's, that's another of, question, I guess, is uh, can, yeah. can you run a D9 with, uh, with stock springs? I did on the 77 and it seemed to be okay. I didn't rev the hell out of it, like 6,000 max. Do you know what the, the stock, the, the cam lift is? Well, I go look at the box, hang on. I'll get out of the Relic uh, V12 Jag that I'm currently working on. Standard, the standard lift is 0.265, which the workshop right. manual calls 0.250. I don't know what they, I don't know what happened to that extra 15,000. Um, let me see if I can read this. Uh, the, the, the difference in those lifts, John, is the, the rocker ratios. I mean, you can take 20 rockers and check them all, and you won't find two of them that, that are the same lift. Right. But the question, how, how aggressive is this D9? Is it really something for the street? You know, I'm not that familiar with a B9. That's why I wanted to know if you could give me some cam specs. D for Delta 9. Uh, duration 0 0.050, 229 deg. Intake opens at 8, closes at 41. Exhaust opens at 41, closes at 8. Uh, that's, two, nine, nine, that's five, not a really low. radical thing. Yeah, what's the, what's the so lift? Two, 108 degrees, valve flash 0 0.018. And that, that's all it's. Yeah. It, there it's has a 295. It's a 295. 295? Yeah. Okay, 295 mm -hmm. is is not really too bad. 295 is going to give you 430 at the valve. Um, you could put that cam in. I wouldn't call Just that any it. more than about a stage three cam. So you you could run it with a with an unmodified head and valve springs. Yes. Yep. You could. Okay. And is there any point in putting one and three quarter inch heads on, on a stock 79 or 80 head? What are you running now? Uh, I've actually got a downdraft Weber, like a 32, 36. Okay, so a 32, 36. So, if, you know, if you take, you take 36 millimeters times point zero three nine three seven, so that's a butterfly of 1.41, okay? The, the 31 is, is, the 32 is even smaller than that. So you're changing your butterflies all of a sudden to inch and three quarters, which is, you know, 1.750. All of a sudden you're gonna have a whole lot more butterfly than you do on that downdraft. And, you, and your manifold actually on the SUs works pretty well. So I'd say that would be a pretty big gain. Now, that being said, the inch and three quarter carburetor really likes top end more than it does mid-range. So you, you probably will have some needle issues at mid-range, but you'll love it going down the highway at, at uh, 4,500. And it, it was nice that they were nice on the, on the 77 previously. And that had a stock head. It just didn't idle so well and transitions were a little rough. But uh, if you kept your foot planted, yeah. it, it was good. And that's that's why that carburetor works so well on that. But there's no reason why you can't get to a chassis dyno and find the correct needle or do some needle tuning to take care of that mid-range. Well, this is, I'm wondering whether to slap those two things. I've got headers on the head already, uh, head, header exhaust pipes. Uh, is it worth putting the 1.75 SUs, which I've already got, you know, they're paid for, and the, yep. um, and the D9 cam with a head, or am I wasting my time until I get some head work? 
Um, actually, if you have a good running engine, why would you take it apart to put a cam in? Because when you go to do that, you're really going to have to have cam bearings. You're going to need valve guides. You're going to you're going to do it. You're going to do an engine rebuild on an engine that may not need to be rebuilt. I think if Scott. you throw those inch and three quarter carburetors on it, you're going to notice a big gain um, without doing an engine rebuild. I I typically tell customers when it's time to rebuild your engine, that's when you put the cam and lifters in, and that's when you do your cam bearings, and that's when you do your your porting and that kind of stuff. If you if you just want to rebuild it, go ahead. So you're thinking the 1.75 SUs are worth it on a stock engine, but the cam is, is not. Is, it, is yes. that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I, the reason no, no, I got no, the cam no, was no, the no. Set, couple I of think flat loads. The, I think the cam. I think the cam would help. Uh, don't get me wrong. I think the cam would help. It's just a matter of whether or not you want to go to that amount of work. Oh, I don't mind doing the work. It's leaking all over the front. I've got to take things off and seal them up in here okay you would definitely get a benefit from that cam and carburetor combination with a proper rebuild okay. to go along with it yeah even on a, a stock head unported well if you've got the head off the really the, the late model head really flows real good do you know what the number is is it by any chance a d head or an l head or do you know which head uh, it is Right here, it's manufactured November 79. Okay. It could be a 3196, it's hard to say. You're gonna to have to look and see which one it is, but those heads really have um, good unshrouding already. They've got good short radiuses. Um, you may have to go in and do a little bit of work on the short radius and a little bit of work right at the port. You should make sure that you port your intake manifold to the head so you're going to have to take it all apart. So you're saying open up the exhaust port. No, open up the intake ports to match the intake yes. manifold. That's right. You'll get a gain there. You won't get any gain on the exhaust side. Okay. That's good info. Thank you. Steve, you're welcome. Steve asked the same kind of thing. Um, Steve, you can unmute yourself when, when the time comes here. He said, um, Besides polishing the cylinder head ports, polishing the cylinder head ports, please share what, what else uh, can be done to promote flow and therefore increase horsepower. And this is a, uh, it's a question about the cylinder head, the valves and so forth. Yeah, I'm building, an, en I'm, I'm building an engine for a 67B. Uh, it's the stock rebuilt. Stock rebuild on the block. I just want to do some work on the head uh, to give us some extra punch. Um, I hear there's different valves, perhaps bigger valves. I don't know much about that. Well, your stock valve is 1.625 on the intake. And so you can easily on an MGB engine go to 1.690 which isn't that much bigger. Moss sells those valves. I have those valves. We've always had a pretty, we've always had a pretty good gain in that size difference. As far as the exhaust is concerned, unless you do a lot of porting in the exhaust ports, the stock valve size of 1.350 is just fine. Um, when you're in there doing the valve job, after the valve job is done, you want to do a blend in the, on the bottom of the valve job and get, get all those um, their grooves and ridges and anything that can Im impede the flow makes a big difference on the short radius. The, the long radius, you won't have to do very much to that. And actually, if you open up the port too much right there, you hurt yourself. So very little work right there, just keeping it smooth and then port matching your intake manifold. And then when you go in there to do that, you're going to see that the, the port's not really round, it's more oblong. So you can do a little work in there. And those gains, those gains take me about a half a day. It takes about a half a day to port that. So it might take you a little longer, but that's, I'm saying that to emphasize the fact that you don't need to do a great deal of work there. Okay, very well, good information. Hey, I got another quick question for you. Have you heard 
of Groove technology? What is it? Groove, G-R-O-O-V-E, Groove technology. Uh, some guys, yeah, some guy's taking cylinder heads and he's grooving. Uh, it's a V on either side of the spark plug and then one down the middle. And he claims that um, he's increasing horsepower and, and getting more flow. Uh, the swirl that happens in the, uh, the, during the process there. It's, you can look it up on, uh, on the web and read up on it. And uh, he's got pictures and there's testimonials. And uh, it's just some guy out there that came up with this where he takes a, a die grinder and uh, puts, yep. groove, puts, puts some grooves into the, into the chamber. Yeah. Well, what he's what he's done is that he's bought in cylinder heads that have had CNC machining done to them. And when you do a CNC cylinder head, they put grooves in that and then your the porter is then supposed to go in and and smooth those grooves out. Well, in certain short radiuses and certain combustion chambers, uh, we found on the flow bench that that not taking those grooves out makes more power. So what he's done is he's just reversed engineered to an, and taken that technology CNC computer controlled porting and taking that to the MG head. And I think that's great that he did that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll be looking into that very well. Hey, thanks yeah. for your help. I, had that, I had that done to my uh, head uh, and my oil actually stays cleaner between oil changes. So I don't know, or, unless that's my imagination, but it just seems to, uh, it seems my oil seems to stay cleaner and it, it, it's hard to tell. We don't have that much power, so it's hard to tell when you're gaining a couple horsepower. He claims that you get more, more complete com, uh, combustion. Uh, the, each fuel particle is like burning more and there's less, there's less um, non-burnt. Um, right. Yeah. He's, he's increasing the There's some yeah. um, groove, G R O O V E, groove technology. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, everyone's heard that. So, yeah, people come by sometimes it's snake oil, sometimes sometimes it's a real, um, mm -hmm. a, a real improvement. Um, I'm going to check it out. So Alan Vinegar has, has said, tell us what you mean by a valve job. When Kent Prather says that he's going to, when Kent says he's going to do a, a, a valve job, what does that mean to Kent Prather? I, can I All speak right. up before, Kent, before you answer? I'll yes. just yes. tell you where I'm at. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. I have a, um, a throw out bearing that needs to be dealt with. And in the MGC, you've got to pull the engine and transmission together. So since I'm going to have the engine out, I just thought it was time to tidy things up. And um, compressions are pretty good, ranges between 140 and 160. Um, I don't have any huge issues, but um, I also wanted to change some valve seals. So if I'm taking the valves or the springs off and the keepers, it's like, so how much further do I have to go to clean those heads and re-grind those, those valve seats? So if you could just run me through that. Okay. And to decarbon. And I've done, some, I've done some MGC heads and they hold up pretty well. Um, the, the heart of all these valve jobs is the valve guide. So you actually, my advice to people that are running street cylinder heads is to continue to use the cast guide. A lot of people want to use a bronze guide. Um, the problem with a bronze guide is you have to open up your clearance quite a bit to make a bronze guide not stick the valve when it, if you had an overheating situation. So Too late. Too, typically, late. <laughs> Too late. Bronze guides are in. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If you have bronze guides in there, so you want to make sure you take it to a machine shop that can measure that guide and find out what you've got. So the bronze guide needs two thousandths clearance minimum on the intake. So I go between two and two and a half on the intake. Okay. And I go between and I go between two and a half 
and two and three quarters, almost to three on the exhaust. So that's okay. that's pretty that's pretty wobbly. So when you when you do that, your valve job is not going to last very long. So if you already have you already have bronze guides in there, then you're going to find that your seats are going to be quite pounded. Right. When they when they pound when they pound they get wide. When they get wide, they don't perform as well. So a valve job consists of getting your valve guide correct and then narrowing up the seats. Now, we all know that it's a 45 that you use as your standard um, seat. And then you want to do three angles. So you want a 30 or a 35 on the top. I like 35. And then you want to use a 60 on the bottom. But um, depending on where you take it, there's a cutter now that everybody's been using. We've been using it for the last 20 years. It puts a radius on the bottom of a round angle. So you narrow up your 45 with a nice radius on the bottom. Then you go in and you blend that afterwards. And that's what a valve job is. Okay. So you're, you're suggesting let, let a machine shop do that part of the job. I just provide them with the head. Yeah, take the head apart and um, go ahead and clean it really well. Get as much carbon out of it as you can, and let the let the machine shop do the do a valve job. You do, do you have all that equipment to do a valve job? No. <laughs> okay, so you can tell them you can tell them your your preferences in what you want. That you want a nice narrow valve job, and you want and you give them the valves the guide specs. So that they know what to expect there. If he tells you that the guides are bigger than that, then you're just going to have to either knurl or replace. Right. Okay. If you use a cast iron guide, you can tighten up your clearances. I like to I like to do an intake with a cast guide at one and a half, and an exhaust at two. So all of a sudden your valve hits the seat flatter, and the, the valve job lasts longer. And you actually will enjoy that better than with bronze guides. Okay, good advice. Thank you. All right, well, I think you, you gave me a you know pretty pretty solid advice. That's great. Okay. Okay. So welcome. we we have uh, oh just a second. We got Barry who wants to contact Norm Ewing. So um, I don't know if Norm's still on here, but Barry, if you'll send me a note tomorrow. Uh, on email tonight, I'll, I'll send that right on to Norm Ewing from South Africa. So that's my answer for Barry. Brad has a question. Go ahead. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome. So Brad has a question for Kent. Uh, do your race engines exceed 32 degrees timing? I ask because my VP12 cam higher compression, ported head engine seems to like more timing. And I'm wondering if that's right or if it's common. Actually, I've found that the, the best timing for like a VP12 would be 34 degrees. Okay. Now, okay, good, that's where I'm at. <laughs> when we dyno, when you're dynoing, um, you want to course get the head torque get the valves adjusted get the ring seated do all the normal stuff that you're doing in break in but the next thing we do is determine how much timing an engine wants so as you're sneaking up on the um, um, jetting as you're sneaking up on the jetting you want to sneak up on the timing too and so i'd say um, it's very rare to need 36 Sometimes even 35 isn't good, but I, I will tell you this, that it's hard to jet an MG motor at 30 degrees. If it's a racing engine with a VP12 higher compression, you've got a good valve job going, you're going to find that it's easier to jet, it's easier to, to tune and jet at 32 than it is at 30. Okay, I had it on so the dyno and we... Every time I increased the timing, it, it made more power, and I kept increasing the timing until I started getting kind of nervous. <laughs> so I left it at 34 all in, but, um, but yeah, I was definitely happier 
the more timing I put in it. And what fuel are you using? Uh, 94 octane. Okay. And your compression is only what? Only 9.6 to 1, really theoretical compression. Okay. So it's not, so a street not super engine, high. A street, yeah, a street engine with that compression, um, if it was on my dyno, if we made power at 34, we'd move it to 36 and see if we made power. If we made power at 36, we'd move it to 38 and see if we made power. We'd probably yeah. lose power at 38 and then I'd back it back to 36. So that's the that's the advantage of the dyno. So if it says you can use it, then you can. And then what'll happen yeah. to you is when you get out on the road and you do your road tuning and John Twist knows all about road tuning, you'll find that maybe you'll maybe you need to be back at 34 despite the fact that 36 was your optimum timing mm -hmm. all right good thank you you answered my other question which was going to be about larger carburation so now you got me thinking <laughs> thank you well if you don't have enough cylinder head porting to make a bigger carburetor work you're just going to find out that um, you're gonna have top end, but you're gonna have a bad mid-range. Yeah, I do spend enough time at the top end. I might get some benefit from it. I do some track tracking with the car. So okay. might be worth yeah, if you're, trying. Yeah. Butterfly size is everything. And uh, Brock has weighed in here and said those grooves in the cylinder head are called so Mender Singh grooves and were discussed at the, on the MG Experience website, apparently at length some time ago. So it's uh, S-O-M-E-N-D-E-R, so Mender. Um, th those are those grooves. Well, I'm, I'm uh, calling out to see if, if anyone else has uh, any questions. I, I've, I've been through the chat. There's a lot of stuff about brakes and lights and other stuff that I'll, I'll get to, but I want to know if there's anything else for, for uh, Ken Prather while he's still on, or at least still involved with, with taking the, these, these questions. If no one has anything, I want to thank Ken very, very much for, for hanging on as long as you did and answering the questions that we had. Again, you've got pra uh, Prather Racing dot com and he's uh, probably as available as, as I am you call sometimes he picks up the phone sometimes he'll call you back um, and you can get some of your questions answered um, but be kind because he doesn't want to spend two hours discussing engine rebuilding maybe you could recommend a book or, or some pub do you have anything published Kent do you have anything written down that you can order for 25 bucks or something well, no, actually not. I've thought about doing that, send out some of my secrets, but there's a lot of books written on us on this subject. I just have taken a lot of these different things to a higher degree, and I may at some point. I've just got to get this um, get this 1962 Mark II MGA back running again. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very kindly. Now I'm going to buzz back, um, and while I'm looking, let me remind um, you that if um, if you have the opportunity, you're on my website and you see that PayPal button, that's really nice. Order something from Kent too to help me pay for uh, um, his time on here tonight too. And I'm just scrolling back and I've got, uh, we talked about the rear sill and the midget. Okay, here we go. Here we go, it's off, off engine subject now. This is from Adams to everyone. Uh, John, my MGA steering column has been stiff turning and I found the felts were dry. Should those felts be oiled or greased? Well, I'd, I'd oil them, um, but there's a lot of things that make the steering stiff. You've got the left king pin, the right king pin, the rack and pinion, the steering U-joint, and the steering column. So unless you start to disconnect some of this stuff, you really don't know what's stiff. I mean, I know it's stiff to turn, obviously, but 
The easy way here is to, is to pop the tie rod ends off the steering arms. You can do that with, uh, with a socket and a great big pry bar and a hammer. I've got a YouTube video up about it. You hit the steering arm really, really hard while it's under pressure and that cone that holds the tie rod end into the steering arm will pop out. Now you've got the king pins. Do those, do those wiggle? Are those nice and free? Um, and then is the rack and pinion stiff. The rack and pinion needs to be oiled. A 90 weight gear oil that goes in the top through the adjuster pack. I know there's a grease fitting on the front of the rack and pinion, but it's not a grease fitting. It's an oil fitting. And if you've pumped it full of grease or the DPO is pumped it full of grease, then it's going to be really, really stiff. So if you're not sure, you can always take one of the rack boots off or both of them and roll it lock to lock. And there's either oil or there's, or there's some semi-oily grease. If it's grease, roll it back and forth and back and forth. And every time the rack comes all the way out with the rack boot off, wipe the grease off it, run it all the way the other way, wipe the grease off. After you've done that 50 times, um, you'll be satisfied that you've got as much grease out of there as you can. Of course, you could get more out if you tried, but that's probably enough. And then go ahead and put the rack boots back on and oil it. So just uh, it'll cause a sluggish, um, that rack and pinion being full of grease will be sluggish. But back to the, back to the felts, if you take the top felt out, almost always you can take the steering wheel and move it up and down. Those felts expand through use. And I, I would imagine that, that, that they don't need to be lubricated, but if you were to lubricate them, take the top, pull the top felt out, squirt oil down the, the outer column, it'll trickle down, down towards the front and oil up the front. But if you put oil on them, it'll also cause the felt to swell a little bit. So maybe, maybe it would cause them to get a little, a little thicker and maybe a little tighter, especially if they're new ones, because the new felt isn't as quite as thin as the old felt. It probably should be graphited, quite frankly. Um, but now we're taking the whole steering column out of the car. This is a big project. If it's the steering column, that's the problem in the first place. So anyway, that was a long answer Adams, are you are you still on? Adams, can you unmute yourself? I haven't asked anybody yet where, where they're from. Um, Jim Holliday's from London. Steve Shivington's from Ohio, London, Ontario. Um, so anyway, that's as much I've got to say about that. So from JGA, I haven't got full names here. It's frustrating. I I have to ask my daughter when this is all done how, how to make this work. My, my 1975 MG Beanie's headlights. And I can use either LED or halogen bulbs. Can I use either LEDs or halogens without a conversion? You can certainly use LEDs without a conversion, but do halogen bulbs take more current than an incandescent bulb? I don't know. I don't know that. If they, if they draw more current, if the wattage is higher, then you'd want to put a relay on the headlights so you can save your, your dash light switch. You can buy a new dash switch, no problem. You can buy it. It doesn't look quite the same. It probably isn't built quite as durably as the original one. So if you can save your original one by having it only turn on and off some relays, which takes just a trickle of current, literally, um, then you can save the switch. The switch is what you want to save. So, um, but LEDs, LEDs turn in, turn electricity into light far more efficiently than, than halogens or uh, incandescent. So the incandescents are 6014s, 6014. The halogens are 6024s, 6024. I don't know the part number on the LED bulbs. Hey, John. Yes. Yeah, this, this is Kurt from York. I just went through that uh, with mine, and there's actually two different types of halogen, too, which I didn't realize. There's a quartz halogen, 
and a regular halogen. And according to my electrician friend, the quartz halogen do use a lot more power than the regular halogen. But if you've got a car with an alternator, they'll both be fine. Uh, the LEDs are much better. That's what I've got on my, my B now, and they're wonderful to use. Uh, is you just got to make sure you aim them properly and double check that. Otherwise, you'll blind people. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And those are, those are off-the-shelf items at, at Napa? Uh, the, the halogens are. I did have to order the LEDs. I actually got them from Little, Little British Car Company. He's, okay. been running, he's been running a special on them, and they fit perfect. Okay. Uh, I put those from LBC on both my TD and my MGA Mark II. And I, I don't do a whole lot of night driving, but I, I turn them on during the daytime a lot of times because these cars seem to be invisible to SUVs. But uh, I do notice, I uh, mean, just looking at the ammeter, uh, the LEDs draw very little power uh, and they light up nicely. And it was just a plug and play. Uh, they're bipolar, they don't care, and they fit right in. Okay. So well, thank you. I'm so be good with the LEDs because I can't I can't find regular incandescents. I'm so I've been looking and looking and looking, and uh, I went to a mechanic. He tried to put halogens in. I said no because you know we always have electrical problems with these cars. And but if you say the only danger of putting in a halogen is I could burn out my my switch, a headlight switch. It's the it's the headlight switch. The 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 wires will carry the current. The alternator makes plenty of electricity. And that's not the issue. It's the switch, and all that energy runs through that little tiny switch, and it, it'll they they get hot. They get hot, and then they melt. So, okay, thank you. If you put a relay in the circuit, then the switch is only turning on the relay, which takes like less electricity than than a hundred LEDs bulbs, and then the main power is run through that. I'm doing my daughter's MGB GT right now, and I've got um, 1624 halogens in there, and I've I've, I've run um, relays on that. The kit that I bought though has only one uh, one fuse in it. Well, the headlights aren't fused anyway. Not from not not from 1945 to 1980, headlights were never fused. But if you are going to fuse them, why would you put in just one fuse? Wouldn't you put a fuse for high beam and a fuse for low beam? I mean, because if one of them popped, wouldn't you want some headlights? Anyway, so that, that was a, a small change that I made in the kit that I bought. So. Thank you. Hey, John. Yes. I, I put the uh, I put the Moss, Moss relays in. This is Mark from Cleveland. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I, I put the MOS relays in, and there's one fuse, but it's on the input to the to the relay block. It's not on the, it's not going from the relay to the headlights. Right. It's going from the, the power into the. Just the power into the into the, into the pair of relays, but still, if you pop the fuse, you're not going to get high beams or low beams. Right. Exactly. Now the other thing is. The, the, there's two kinds of, of halogens. I know you said quartz. I started with a halogen sealed beam, which was a direct replacement for the incandescent. But then I put the hellas in, and those are H4s. So that's where the reflector stays, and you can take the bulb out from the back. Okay. To, to replace the halogen. Um, and, and I've been looking at the LEDs, and my understanding is that the reflector is different. So I could put an H4 style LED into, into my headlight bucket. But my understanding is the way the LEDs work, that the reflector is not right. You really need to put in an LED reflector. I don't know if that's true or not. I haven't done it. Maybe somebody else has an idea. Um, I did look at the item from Little British. Um, I just spent a hundred bucks on the hell is I wasn't ready to replace them right away with the LEDs. Um, so I don't know if they're better or not. When I, did mine, uh, I was replacing seal beams, so the entire unit came out of the headlight holder, and the uh, kit that came from LBC was the was the reflector and the um, I mean, it was the whole thing. It was the reflector with the LED bulb that went into the back of it, and it had had the lens on it. 
So it, it, it is a Which would lead me to believe that, that would, that would lead me to believe that you would probably have a better experience than if I just put an LED into the back of my halogen reflectors, at least from what I'm reading. Could, but, the reflector that you got is probably different than the one I have. But daytime driving, it, it, it doesn't really make it, any difference. So. It, um, it certainly could be. Uh, Greg Purvis and I worked together at a couple different places for a long time. And he, he claimed to have been the last theater lighting uh, graduate from Hope College in uh, Holland, Michigan. So we finally got in, I don't know, a PA, something or other, where you had to actually move the bulb in, inside the reflector to, to get the beams to run straight ahead because all the, all the lights you buy today are pre-focused. Um, but Greg actually had to focus this. And he said, finally, finally, I got to use my, my college major. <laughs> so. Um, yeah. So yeah, well, if the if the if the position of the filament or whatever it is in the bulbs are different between the halogen and the LEDs, if the bulbs even fit the same reflector, chances are that they aren't going to work. You probably ought to buy the same reflector that's being sold for wh whichever light source you have. Well, the LEDs the LEDs have been from the side of the from the side of the bulb and I think that's the difference whereas a halogen or incandescent emits from the front from all around actually but if you look at an LED the, the diodes are on the side well that's okay. Mark uh, I give you a clue on that uh, with a little bit everyone makes a different bulb there's a whole ton of headlight bulbs LED some of them have the lights all around them some of them have two lights on the bottom one on the top they're all different and the difference will make as to whether they're high and low beam. And as to what, because they don't just light up so many for high beam and so many for low beam. They actually have them angled in there. So, and this is what I found out by going through about 50 different companies and talking to them. And the ones from Little British Car Company for the price are unbelievably good. Um, I've seen them as high as $215, $230 for a pair LBCs are only like $90 and they work really well. The only thing I've had people tell me for sure is with some of them, the ones that you're talking about that have the lights all around, okay, those you would have to take your headlights and aim them properly because a lot of times they will not be reflecting in the way that you want without blinding somebody. Okay, well, I appreciate that. And I've been looking at, and I know Jeff sells pretty much quality stuff at LBC. In fact, I got a huge box from him yesterday. Um, I may revisit that then. I'm glad to hear that you've had experience and, and that's good to know. So one of the problems with LED bulbs is they don't compare to a halogen. Halogen bulb for a headlight, um, the light is a single source and the reflector is dealing with a single source uh, as far as aiming the light. If you have a LED bulb, it's not a single source and it's almost impossible to get that to aim right. Um, I spoke to some experts at Hella on this and um, it, even to put an HID bulb in a, in, a, um, in a halogen fitting, in a halogen light um, isn't accurate because the light source is in a different place. So anytime you go to a different type of bulb, um, from what the light was designed for, um, you will not have the correct um, output. Which would explain, I guess, why you would want a, a reflector designed for, for an LED as opposed to taking an LED and sticking it in my halogen reflector. Let me put my two cents worth in here, if I could, please. Go um, ahead, Dan. Yeah, I have a 54 TF for any of the older cars. And I put in uh, positive ground LED headlights in it. It's a kit from Moss. And they, it was a whole unit. You took out the original, the whole works and put their reflector and everything in it, the converter and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they work great and uh, vastly improved the nighttime visibility of the car. And by the way, uh, on relays, uh, in my car, I have, uh, 
a relay block that has six relays, each with an individual fuse, plus two other sets of relays. So all of the high current draw items in the car are run through relays rather than through the panel switches. And that's been working really well for me, no problems at all. So that includes a, a pressure electric fan, auxiliary cooling fan ahead of the radiator, which I think is pretty necessary in South Texas. Okay. Dan, that's, that's, uh, that's fascinating. But those switches on the TF, those things will handle all kinds of amps. Those, those switches are so durable, but by the time you get to 1973, man, those things are just plastic and, and you look at the, the blades on the inside and you just wonder why they've lasted as long as they have. So, you know what? Maybe what we should do is, is uh, talk about headlights, put that up as a, as a uh, this has engendered a lot, of, a lot of discussion here. So. Yeah, well, you know, I, I know a lot more about electrical stuff than I do about mechanical stuff. So I just decided to do all the wiring because I understand it better. Well, very good. Well, let's see, we got the next one up here, JBW. Do you know of a good oil pan windage tray for my MGTC? So the, I don't know of any windage trays made for, for T-type for the XPAG, XPAG engines. So JBW, are you still on? We're down to, down to 100, 150 people, 148 people here. Um, Doug, are you on? Did, did, did you get our max number tonight? Uh, two, sorry, John, 211. 211. All right, 211, that's great, thank you. Thanks. I don't. I don't think it's going to pop pop back up. So anyway, a windage tray is designed to windage tray. I was going to say scrape the oil off the off the crank, but that's a that's an oil scraper. So I'm not sure. Anyway, I don't know. JVW. Um, there's a couple of expert experts on the XPAG engine. Uh, in North America, one of them is Bob Grinnell, who lives north, west, northeast of Toronto. Uh, there's Tom Langa at Half Moon Farm in Maine. Both those guys are, are really good and know this stuff really, really well. Alan, the nut holding the choke cable uh, in place on the, and then it disappears, but <clears throat> Alan, are you still on? Do you still have a question about the nut that holds the choke cable on your 1973 MGB GT or whatever it is? So the original nut, I, I don't know if this is what he's asking about, this is about that, if you can possibly see, it's the thinnest nut in the whole car. It's a, it's a half inch, half inch uh, uh, fine thread and it's only got about two threads in it. I mean, the thing is so tiny. And you can't get a wrench on it. It's just a horror. You have to make a special wrench to get the choke cable off your MGB if you want to change it. And then when you go to put it on, again, you're faced with this unbelievably thin little nut. So go to the hardware store and buy a half 20 great big nut, a real one, make sure it fits on the choke cable, take the choke cable with you. Now, when you get up underneath the dash, uh, with that special wrench, you can actually get the wrench on the nut and tighten it up. So anyway, that's that's my comment about about the nuts holding the choke assembly, uh, choke cable assembly in place. So Mr. Peltier, Chad Peltier, um, um, having problems with a 76 MGB popping at a speed of around 50 miles an hour and was told that either the distributor is cracked or I'm not getting enough fuel. Well, either the timing's wrong or there's a problem with the, with the uh, mixture. That is absolutely correct. So Chad, are you still on? But if he's not, lots of us have, have this problem. So there's a, there's a situation that you can run into that you're running down the road and if you hit a slight incline, just a slight incline, the car will spit, cough, hiccup, whatever you want to call it, 
like that. It actually shoots flames out of the carburetor. It's really dramatic to see happen. Um, that's either because the timing is too retarded or the mixture is too lean. And because it's always the timing that's screwed up, then what you want to do is make sure that that timing is 32 degrees before top dead center at full mechanical advance, vacuum disconnected. But it requires that the distributor is a good distributor too, although at 50 miles an hour, it's all the way advanced, that's for sure. But you want to make sure your distributor is a good distributor. And that doesn't mean a new distributor. That means a really good distributor, which you can, you can take your old distributor and have it rebuilt and make sure that the advanced spec follows the 40897 original MGB uh, distributor spec as long as you can get a, a um, vacuum port off your carburetor, which you can on the 76, even though it's a Stromberg. So anyway. It's always, it's always, it's always, in the end, it's all, always timing. Speaking of that, um, a, a fellow contacted me today and said that his engine, he was talking about rebuilding his engine because when he sits and idles for a while and then taps the throttle, out comes the smoke out of his tailpipe. So there's only three things that cause, um, cause the engine to, use oil, uh, bad valve guides, uh, bad rings, or a plugged up uh, engine vent or PCV system. So it's always the rings. I mean, that's the rule. You just, you try everything else, but it's always the rings. In this case, the way that this gentleman described his problem to me, it's not the rings, it's the valve guides. And you, you always do the cheapest least complicated, least expensive, I guess I said that once, simplest thing first. So you can change the, the umbrella seals on top of the, all you have to do is the inlet valves. You can do the exhaust valves, you don't have to, because uh, that's not what's causing the smoke. Uh, you can do the inlet valves and you can do that in place on your car by, by using air pressure to hold the valves closed or feeding rope down the cylinder, cotton clothesline rope, and uh, then spinning the engine over by hand, not with the starter motor, please, uh, so that the rope pushes up against the valves and holds the valves closed while you remove the top keeper and get the springs off and change that, that uh, umbrella oil seal, which is a Felpro, that's the trade name, F-E-L-P-R-O. This is for an MGA or an MGB engine. It's a 70373 Velpro SS 70373. That's the valve guide umbrella seal. So anyway. Okay, so from Alan, the dash came loose. Oh, here, this is a continuation. Um, uh, he's talking about trying to get this nut off the off the back side of the of the uh, uh, throttle cable, and this, this is on any MGB from uh, 68 through 74 with a, with a um, the pull in the upper right-hand corner of the instrument cluster. So you cannot even begin to reach that until you take the heater control off. So you've got to heat the heater control that's right underneath the, the gear shift knot or the choke it's got, a, uh, it's got a knob on it. You use a uh, poker, scribe, dental tool, something like that, to press the little button inside, pull the knob off, use a 5 8 deep socket, spin the nut off that's underneath all that. There's a lock washer and a flat washer. And then you wrestle the heater control out from the back side of the dash. And then it just dangles. And then, and only then, can you reach your hand up in there and get to that nut but you can't even tighten that nut. It's a three quarter inch wrench that's necessary. You can't even tighten that nut unless you've got a, a wrench that's a ring spanner or that you've cut a slot in that you can fit around, around the um, cable. And even when you've done that, it's dicey because you can't see what you're doing. Anyway, 
That's how you reach it. Spencer, Spencer, I recently rebuilt the 998 engine for my 78 Mini. I had, I had the rebuilt engine running. While at fast idle, the car all of a sudden dropped idle for a minute and then eventually stalled. I've not been able to get the engine to start since. Knowing I did not run out of fuel, any ideas on where to look? I confirmed fuel delivery, spark, and timing. The plugs seem to be fouled from continuous cranking. Well, the first thing is, is get clean plugs. First thing, get clean plugs, because uh, a plug with carbon on it will, will just short. It won't fire at all. And you cannot clean carbon. There are only two ways to clean carbon. Carbon tetrachloride, like you used to put the butterflies in when you were a kid. Can't buy that anymore. It's too dangerous. And the other way is to burn it off. Uh, so you get to put it, bring it in the house and put it in the oven and put the oven, oven on self clean uh, when your wife isn't at home and burn the carbon off. Instead of doing all that, you just go out and buy yourself another set of spark plugs. Frustrating because you just bought the set that you've ruined. You didn't ruin them. You just got them dirty. Um, you know, but you need clean plugs in, in there. You can clean old plugs by putting them in one at a time in an engine and making it misfire for a little bit and then it'll clear out and clean up the plug. But start with clean plugs. You gotta have fuel, you gotta have gas. The engine, as long as the engine spins over, then just go through it. If you got compression, is your valve lash correct? Is your timing correct? Fuel, does, it, it, chances are that fuel hasn't changed much, but in that order. So, and if anybody has a question like this, like Spencer has on something like this, that it's his car, there's a lot of real specifics to it, call me, I'm, I'm, I, I, I will, um, I'm happy to, to answer and, and uh, do the best I can to, to get you going in the right direction. And Steve Shevington weighed in to help out uh, uh, Spencer. Steve's from Ohio, um, and he's talking about looking for vacuum leaks. Didn't think of that, Steve. Thank you very much. There's a particular thing on a B-series engine, MGA or MGB, where sometimes if you're shutting the car off and it backfires, it, 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 it pops back out the inlet, and the, the throttles are closed. Like you've just you turned the car off, throttles are closed, but somehow it pops back into the carburetors. The pressure is so great, it can blow the freeze plugs out of one end or the other on the inlet, on the inlet manifold. Does this car have an inlet manifold like that with freeze plugs on the end? I, I, don't, I don't think so, but I don't know. So if it is, yes, absolutely. If you, get a, if you get a vacuum leak, but that wouldn't have caused the car probably to slow down like that. So there's more going on there. Rodolfo, hey, Rodolfo, are you on still? From uh, Monterey, Mexico. Uh, I, don't, I, don't see, I don't see him here, but anyway, his, his complaint is that second gear on a 65B pops out after releasing the gas pedal. He says, I just changed the oil on the rebuild, nothing else. Um, does this mean that the gearbox should, should come out? Boy, something something isn't lined up right. So it's not uh, when you when you engage it and push it forward. That means that the main shaft is too far forward. The main shaft inside the gearbox is too far forward. Why would that be? But that must be what what's going on because the engagement teeth on the speed gear. And all I can do is here is use my fingers. You've got the engagement teeth, and then the the sliding hub slips over it. But if it just comes up to it and sort of engages, it'll stay there. But then shifting and the gears flexing and moving on acceleration and de deceleration, if it's not fully engaged, it can, it can fall out of gear. Quite frankly, that happens occasionally in third gear on my MGA, uh, which either means that the shifter isn't in the right spot, which that doesn't make any sense. Or the main shaft is set too far back. Why would that be? So anyway. Um, John, I got an answer for you there. Marty. 
Yeah, how are you doing? Hey, great. Uh, <clears throat> the second gear pop out thing, or <clears throat> I mean, the, the third gear popping out of gear on overrun, uh, that's from way back. That's in the workshop manual. It's recognized by the factory, and they tell you how to fix it. It's a detent problem. You just grind the detent a little bit deeper, put a little stronger spring behind the ball. Now, popping out of second gear, I had that happen to me one time when I was autocrossing back in the 90s. And the issue was the uh, retaining ring for the third gear on the front end of the main shaft came loose. It's a little splined washer on there. You push yeah. it on, twist it, a little spring-loaded pin holds it in place. <clears throat> well, a little spring-loaded pin broke and that retaining ring rotated and popped off. And third gear was allowed to float forward. So that they and were that allowed them. That allowed the main shaft to float backwards, and that made it pop out of second gear on overrun. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. One of the tricks on a T-type gearbox, which most T-types have got a walking first gear, means if you put it in first gear and drive far enough, it walks out of gear and goes into neutral, is to put two detents in it. So if you, if you got a T-type and you're doing the gearbox right now or you want to know, contact me later, but it has to, you've already got a detent at the top. We're talking about putting a detent in the side of the shaft, a uh, detent in the side of the shaft and putting a ball and spring underneath the cross drilling at the rear of the gearbox. But Barney's talking about the same thing too, making the, making the detent in the, in the shaft deeper than it is now. There's a lot of force in there. Those gears would always rather pop apart than than carry the carry the force. So a lot of forces. Tony Wheeler Dealers had a machine shop fit a modified five main MGB rear seal uh, fitted to an MGA engine. Wheeler Dealers. So that's uh, that's a that's a TV show. Wheeler Dealers. I'm not a car guy, so I don't I don't watch any any anything about cars. I'm an MG guy. <laughs> I'll give you that. Um, anyway, Wheeler Dealers, season 12, episode three, uh, dated 4-8-2015. Uh, a machine shop in California did the work, and the machine shop is listed in the credits at the end of the show. Barney's got a, a uh, on his side has got a couple ways to slow down or stop that that uh, leak too. And Barney's site is mgaguru.com, but the, as far as the engine goes, a lot of engine stuff is the same, whether you're dealing with a 1955 B-series or a, a 1980 B-series. Uh, so from David Kwan, hi from the six, Nine. Nine, my ignition switch is broken. How hard is it to remove the lock barrel from the steering column? Uh, can you describe the, the process? Do you have a video? I don't know if I got a video or not. I, I still have yet to index all, all my videos, but assuming that it's on the column, then you've got column covers. The column covers come off. If you've got a midget, you got to drop the steering column to get the column covers off. You got a B, you can get the column covers off, um, struggling them around the switches that, that come out on e either side of the, of the column covers. Once those are off, then you've got shear bolts, like S-H-E-A-R bolts that somebody tightened up until they snapped off. That, those come in the, in the replacement uh, lock assembly too, but don't do it. Don't break them off. <laughs> don't break them off. Then if you ever want to take it back off again, you just unscrew it. Now you've got two things you can do with the shear bolt, which has got sort of this hemispherical head with not a hint of any way to get a hold of it. You can cut a slot in him, okay? Cut a slot in him with a hacksaw or a die grinder, put a screwdriver in, unscrew him, comes right out, or take a prick punch and tap the outside diameter of the screw and just tap it around and unscrew it. Only danger with having a hammer inside your car is the dash, the windshield, and the instruments. So take take your pick. So, but that that's the way to to get that off. 
Okay, we've got Dan McGovern from uh, Slidell, Louisiana with a 77 midget 1500. I should let you know that the correct felt washer seal on the dipstick solved the oil blowing out of my newly rebuilt 1500 engine with a Weber downdraft. He said, I don't really understand why, but he'll accept it. So it could be that since the dipstick is on the right-hand side of the engine and the engine turns uh, clockwise, as you see it from the front, that the oil is getting whipped up against the dipstick. So it isn't a, a function of whether the inside of the engine is pressurized, it's just splash. And by okay. putting the, the correct stuff in place, it, it's, it, stopped, it stopped it. Does that That's make sense, Dan? That it may be just Venturi action of the air blowing across the top at, at, at highway speed. Okay. Oh, and as far as the, the safety bolts or the, the break off bolts, a spring loaded center punch takes them out without any problem at all. Okay. The spring loaded center punch. I didn't even know there was such a thing. Okay. Yeah, you just Thank keep you. snapping it along there, and it you know, takes 20, 30 snaps before it starts moving, but it, you, know, you don't even break a sweat. Okay. All right. And Dan complains that he's still using a quart of oil every 200 miles or so. Runs good, good compression. When should the engine be considered broken in? Well, when it quits using oil. But how many miles do you, do you have on the engine now, Dan? It's down in the next time, about 700. But I don't know because I just fixed the odometer last week. Uh, the little shaft on the numbers with the little plastic seat clip was loose, and I had to fiddle with that. Okay. It should, it, it should have broken in by, by now. But again, you know, it, you, should, you always do the cheapest, easiest, simplest stuff first. So just go out on the, on, what, what do you got there, I-10 or something? Yep. Just get, get on the expressway and take quartz oil with you and plan on half a day and drive a quarter of a day out and a quarter of the day back and just put high speed miles on it. Check the oil every, you know, every so often. Right and just see if that running in will do it. Um, the um, cast iron rings are, are always great. Although uh, Kent Prather today said that he liked, uh, wasn't perfect circle, uh, what perfect seal? I, I can't remember what he said, but he, you know, he liked one, one type of ring, but I'm a, I'm a firm believer in, in uh, cast iron rings. Maybe the ones he have are, he has our, our cast iron too. It was total seal rings. Total seal. Thank you. Thank you. And it has about 30 hours. I put an hour meter on it, so it's about 33 running hours on the engine. That's a lot of time. That's yeah. what I would have thought. So it, ought That's, to be. it should be. We had a guy from uh, Kansas called me up. This is, oh, I don't know, 30 years ago and said, oh my gosh, I rebuilt my engine. It's just smoking. And he was, again, from like Kansas City or someplace. And he said, I'm going to drive up and have you guys look at it. And by the time he got here, it wasn't burning any oil. Huh. So it just needed that long run on the expressway. Well, it's definitely yeah. using less and less as I'm going along, but I just wanted to make sure. But okay, that sounds good. I'll go run it. I'm yeah. not going on I-10, though. Those trucks scare me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Hey, Kent Prather here. What oil are you using? Uh, now I'm using a 15W50 uh, Mobile One synthetic with a 1300 plus per million of zinc. Okay, well, there's half your problem right there. Well, I was using Vaveline when it was slinging it out, and it's more expensive. The Vaveline. Uh, but you were, you were still using the synthetic? No, the Vaveline, uh, the uh, racing oil or whatever it is with the, with the zinc in it was what was that? Well, VR1 2050? Right, right. Okay, well, you need to go ahead and switch back to that. You, they're actually, they actually make a bona fide break-in oil. So did you use a break-in oil in the very beginning, or did you use the VR1? No, I started with the VR1. You know, um, there, is, there is a problem with that, and I think that it could be that your rings didn't break in in the beginning. If I was you... I would follow John Twist's advice about getting going down the highway, but I would get that synthetic out and I would go buy um, actual break-in oil. It's a straight 30 weight, and it, right. it should clean those rings out, and that could help you quite a bit. 
Oh, well, that's easy enough. It's a lot easier than tearing anything apart for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, no, you don't need it. to take it apart. Don't, don't take it apart yet. <laughs> you know, I got other things I want to do rather than take the engine apart again. <laughs> there you right. go. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. You're there, welcome. There, there are people that call me and they'll say, well, you know, I got this problem. I say, well, here, here's the easy way. And they say, oh, I already got the engine out. It's like, dude, why didn't you call me yesterday? You know? So, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. Yeah. So, any, anything, you always know, take the easiest stuff first. I mean, there's stuff you can do that ruin, you know, take you upside down or ruin something. But um, anyway, I'm, I'm cruising through these questions here. Um, there was a question about polishing, but I, I think Kent, Kent really didn't talk to that much, but you don't want to polish the inlets in your cylinder head too much. That's my understanding, or you can get some, some uh, condensation on the walls. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see, here's somebody from Harold Nesbitt. I just had a valve job done on my X-Bag engine and they use bronze valve guides. Will it be okay? Maybe. What happens is they, th those bronze guides tighten up. They get hot, they tighten up a gall the valve and the, the valve will stick in there like it's, like it's welded and they never stick closed, they stick, they stick open. Um, sometimes you get, you get a hint of it in the beginning and they'll, they'll um, at high speed, you know, all of a sudden it starts to run crappy and then you slow down, it runs okay again. But um, yeah, those, those bronze valve guys, everybody thought those things were necessary and they, were, they cast me out because of the lead, losing the lead and the gasoline and everything. But it just turns out that at least for street engines, um, the, the cast iron guides are, are just excellent. Because as Ken said, you, you can, um, you can get them down to a really tight clearance and the valve doesn't wobble inside, inside the guide. But you can also use umbrella oil seals too to cover up for the oil consumption that you get from a wobbling stem to guide problem. So anyway, so all you can do, uh, Harold, is run your car and, and hope that, that uh, you don't have a problem, but if you do, sticking valve sticks open, you'll know what, what the problem is. And very rarely can you close it back up again once it goes so badly like that head has to come off. So, all right, from Henry, somebody, I've just pulled the head on my 78 MGB with a blown head gasket. Now that's odd, our cars don't blow head gaskets. Um, is it worthwhile to remove the carbon buildup? Well, I would say yes. Um, take the carbon build off. There isn't much, not like there used to be, not when we had leaded gasoline. Holy moly. Uh, everything's clean now. Top of the pistons, bottom of the, uh, top of the pistons, bottom of the valves. That it's um, used to be just, oh my gosh, you can't believe the stuff that was on there. Anyway, the blown head gasket is odd. You sure want to get the, the head surfaced, make sure it's flat. And it's awfully hard to make sure the block is flat at home, but take all the, all the studs out, um, stuff something down the pushrod holes. So when you put your sanding block on the top of it, Kent's mm -hmm. gonna die now when I tell you what to do, but you know, take some, take some 100 grit sandpaper and sand the top of the block so that um, it's absolutely as clean and smooth as you can get it. But again, you don't want any crap falling down inside the engine. Um, and blow it all, all out when you're done. A cheap trick is to put the pistons halfway up their stroke and put a little oil in each cylinder and then whatever comes off the sand, sandpaper will float in the oil and then you can, you can wipe that out with a rag. It makes a little cleaner job. And make sure that you chamfer the underside of the cylinder head so the head gasket's got some place to move into so it doesn't end up bunching up on that on that center stud on the right-hand side and causing the head to warp, crack. Okay, here we got from the spillers. What's the best valve stem seal? Ken, what, what do you say? Do you use valve stem seals? Uh, can you hear me, John? Yeah, I use, I use, oh, I got I use valve stem seals. 
Um, I got Mr. Spillers on right now, yes. And I got Kent on, so so uh, Mr. Spillers first. What, you're, you got the head off right now or what? No, the head's on, uh, but I want to change the valve seal. But I think you answered the question earlier. You said Felpro 70373, umbrella yes. what you use. Is that about the best all around? Yes, I think that those are no longer available, but if you go into Napa, they'll have an exchange. It fits like a 65 Chevy something or other. Okay. Yeah. What do you use for a B cylinder head? Um, actually, I use a positive seal. And um, unfortunately, I don't have that part number in front of me, but um, I don't like the umbrella seals. I mean, the umbrella seal is definitely better than no seal, but there is a positive seal that you can just put right on the guide and it fits in between the spring and that's the end of it. Really? But un unfortunately, I don't have that part number in front of me. I'm in the house, not in the shop. I don't remember it exactly because I use a bunch of different ones. I have a cutter that I use to cut down the guides on the racing heads, but I do have a stock guide seal. So um, I can email you that tomorrow, John, and you can send it to this fella. Yes, Mr. Spillers, you will. Um, I keep calling you Mr. because I don't know. <laughs> Where are you from, Spillers? Bro Bridge, Louisiana, near Lafayette, Louisiana. Okay, all right, okay. Well, Kent's gonna send me that note about the about the seal that he used, the positive seal, so. Okay. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you. All right, so here we got a good one from Larry Sears. Here's a mystery. In neutral, with a clutch out, put off the clutch pedal, the engine speeds up, 100 to 200 RPM compared to when the clutch is depressed. This seems wrong. There should be less drag with a clutch in. Clutch seems okay, no creep or anything. Also, it creaks out much faster with a clutch out, but there are no voltage drop. So what's going on here? So Mr. Sears, what the deal is, is that of course, when you depress the clutch, you've got a um, assuming that it's an original thrust bearing and assuming we're talking about a MGB or something, it's a, it's a thrust, the thrust bearing is just a chunk of like number eight carbon. You can, it's carbon, you can write on a piece of paper with it, doesn't show up much, but it's, it's just a hard piece of carbon. And when that is pressed against the thrust plate on the pressure plate, there's a certain amount of heat and friction that's caused and that's why the RPM drops. Spinning the that takes more energy than spinning the gearbox in, in idle. The engine shouldn't drop quite that much, so um, you want to work a little bit with a with a tune up. Um, you, you, uh, Fifty RPM drop, maybe maybe a hundred, but not not two hundred. Um, as the car goes out of tune. Um, sometimes you can press on the clutch and get, get it to almost stall, and and that's uh, that, that's just a, almost always a problem with, with the tune-up. So anyway, it's doing what it's supposed to do. Um, you've just got it back, backwards um, as far as which which system which um, takes the most amount of energy. So, hey John, yes. this is Steve. This is Steve, I yeah. ran into that one time with. Uh, Symptom turned out to be a worn throughout carbon bearing, and we were getting into the cast iron. Okay, it was worn, the, the, the carbon was worn, worn down into the cast iron housing. Okay, and it created more friction. Okay, but I didn't get there was no noise, no extra noise. I know. Almost, almost always when those release bearings fail you pick up some, some kind of trembling in the clutch pedal because it's just hydraulics and whatever movement is right. going on down, in the, down inside there in, in the clutch. It's mm -hmm. transmitted right back up to your foot in real time. Right. So, it's been a while, perhaps so. It's, that was a long time ago. Yeah, but I, I under, yeah, oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> so John, anyway. I got, John, I got a uh, quick answer for this engine slowdown with the clutch. Yes. Uh, it's a pat answer, and it seems to always work. 
uh, if you have, it's a tune-up problem. If you have one carburetor running a little rich and the other carburetor running a little lean, it'll idle just fine because you can set the idle speed at anything you want. But as soon as you push the clutch down and, and you lose 50 RPM or so, then it's out of tune and it screws up both carburetors and then the thing just kind of wants to die. So it's one carburetor rich and one carburetor lean. It idles fine, but when you hit the clutch pedal, it wants to die. Okay. I have reason to believe that. That's, that sounds good. So great. Good. I have, I have people, I, I've had more than one person ask me that. So thanks, Barney. That's very kind. John. Now, yes. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that Amazon's now selling that um, car, uh, the carburetor synchronizer. If someone doesn't already have one, which I assume everyone here does, but um, it's about 40 bucks. So it's a heck of a lot cheaper than uh, Moss, but Amazon's got one now that's um, uh, made in Germany. It's pretty nice if okay. you need to sync your carbs up. Yep, and if, but if you still have reasonable hearing, you can get out of that for two bucks too for, for buying the two feet of heater hose. That's what I use. You, if you see me at the, at the shows doing my, my uh, day long uh, rolling road tech, that, that's just a real fast way of doing it. And you don't have to take the air cleaners off. It isn't as accurate, nowhere nearly as accurate as a, as a meter of course, but you can get really close. Um, this gentleman that uh, was talking to us about uh, uh, Lawrence, Larry Sears, talking about the, um, the clutch also said that halogens of identical wattage draw the same amperage. Um, beware, however, that they draw a higher surge current. So that must mean right when you snap them on, that they, they suck a whole lot of current. That's why those old fuses in those old Lucas fuses in our fuse box say 35 amp, 17 continuous. So they'll take a an, sort of an instantaneous 35 amp surge, but, but uh, won't take more than 17 when they're running. So let's see from iPad, everybody, regarding how the headlight question, can a stock 43 amp alternator run halogens? Yes, because I've got a, I, I know that for sure because I've got, a, I've got a, a generator on my MGA, thank you. And I don't think that thing can put out much more about 25 amps and I've got halogens. Uh, okay, let's see, we're going down here. First of all, we're at 924. I gotta make my pitch again to go to my PayPal site or go to my website and touch that PayPal button, that's be very kind. I, I do appreciate all the support that I get from everybody. It's very, very kind. And go to um, Ken Prather's site and buy something from it. So, so from uh, Monepa, yeah, everybody. It's, it's Pat. Pat, Pat. Oh, yeah, okay. Sorry. 1275 midget, the process of a rebuild. Pistons are Omega. Oh, this is this is really uh, this is really specific here. The pistons are Omega 6.5 CCs. New cam is a 276. Um, two, two, 276 degree cam, right? Light lenders head from mini stock valves using stock HS2 carburetors. Uh, does this sound okay? or should you run HS4s? Well, the small, it depends on what kind of driving you're, you're, you're gonna do. It sounds like you wanna go out and go real fast. It's, so, um, yeah, um, it's 420 over. Where are you gonna be driving? It, it's just a fast street car. That's well, it. the HS2s will be okay. Those will be okay. Although on a 1500 engine, um, the factory fitted twin inch and a halfs on the midget 1500, the home models. Volvo has used a pair, of, a pair of inch and three quarters on their B18 engine. We only use inch and a halfs on our, on our 1800 engines. 
but those HS2s, HS2s will run an MGB just fine up to about 60. Um, so it has to do with how much accelerating you're doing. Um, you know, if you use your stock ones and it turns out that they're they're not okay, you can always always move over and put on the, the larger ones. If you've okay. only got the, the uh, HS2s right now. Vizard, um, David Vizard in his book, David and I think David Anton weighs in pretty heavily in that book, the two Davids. Um, um, a series engine by David Bizarre. He's got a lot of information in there, some of which has to do with um, making those carburetors breathe more air, just doing some little tiny things to them okay. to make them breathe a little, a little bit better. So I'll check that out. Thank you. Okay. So from Paul. He had his, he doesn't say headlight, but he said, I, um, I had my switch melt years ago. I used a 120 volt house switch as a replacement. I've, I've, I've seen that, you, you know, it's, you always go for the least, least expensive, um, least, simplest answer and a light switch will work, but you've also got form and function. Somehow the form form is all, all wrong. Um, you got to remember that voltage doesn't melt the switch. Amperage melts the switch. Right. And yeah. so a uh, house uh, switch is typically rated for 15 or at most 20 amps. And if you're running high powered halogen bulbs, you're pulling more than that sometimes. Okay. So we got a lot of. Um, so oh, Ryan, you've been mispronouncing halogen wrong your whole life. No, oh, all right. Oh, uh, that was just me. Let, let's see. Uh, so back in the days of, of David Letterman and Stupid Kid Tricks, I took my, uh, I don't know how old he was at the time, four-year-old son and decided that I'd teach him the periodic table of elements. And every night after dinner, we practiced and we got it, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, neon, sodium, magnesium. We got through the, we got through all 113 elements. I took a video of him and sent it into Letterman and they called me on a Sunday afternoon from New York City and said, Love it, but we can't use it because we're not doing that that segment anymore. But we'll send it off to America's Funniest Home Videos. So my son was on national television reciting the periodic table blindfolded. Anyway, um, I don't think he can do it. Anymore. <laughs> um, Alan, Alan, how would you seal the sump gasket? Okay, so again, the sump gasket on any of our cars, midget 1500s, T types. Um, no, T-types are, are, are different. T-types, you attach the gasket to the block. T-type, you attach the gasket to the block with gasket seal, like ultra black, and then use grease on the bottom of it. All the other ones, all the other ones um, with stamped steel sumps, you put the, the ultra black between the sump and the gasket and put grease on top of the gasket and then put it together. It won't leak because it's tight. And if you've screwed up the oil pump or something and have to take it back off again, it just drops away so easily. It doesn't leak, it'll, it, it, it's, that's the nuts. The gasket, the gasket material, the ultra black or the right stuff, whatever you're using, goes between the sump and the gasket and between the gasket and the block is grease, lots of grease, okay? Hmm. So that's the way that I, I do it. Now, Barry Jacobs, good night. Uh, Steve Olson, I added a relay to my heater blower fan to save that fan switch and found the fan now blows more air because it blows faster. So there's, I mean, Japanese cars, they got relays on top of relays, right? 
um, our cars have got no, well, 1970 through 1980, there's a starter relay. And from 77 through 80, there's an ignition relay. It isn't really for the ignition, it's for the cooling, cooling fans, which draw more current than anything else in the car, except the, except the starter motor. So, um, anyway, so you can relay it. And the gentleman was on here earlier who had the six relays on his TF. Um, uh, so anyway, that, so you, it helps, it can help. So, so Bruce Mann says, I got LEDs front and rear running brake and turn signals. You know, I had a problem. I went to Napa and I bought LED 1157s. They're, they're, um, they were BP, Bravo Papa, BP. Um, which is the prefix on, on the very earliest MGA engines. Anyway, BP 1150, 1157s. And the, the turn signal, the, the brighter element, oh my gosh, it's like, yes, I can see that from 18 miles away. But the low filament, it's, you can't use the bulbs. They're all 10 bucks each. I got to take them back. So lots of people weighing in here about headlights and um, um, so forth. So anyway, I've got a whole bunch of more messages, but it's 932 and I advertise this as a two hour seminar, but we always run over. So anyway, I want to thank everyone who's here. Thank you very, very much. I especially want to thank Kent Prather Prather for being here and talking to us a little bit about engines. Someday he'll write more information than he has written so far and make it available. But go on, if you're doing an engine, go on his site, help him out. You know, it's just a sale is sale. It's, um, you know, you make something here, you, you make something there. And I want to thank all of you for watching my YouTube videos. Because again, each, I don't know, I don't know what they pay me per video, one hundredth of one cent per view or something, but again, 9 million times anything is something, and, and I do get something each month in my account, so thank you very, very much. Thank you for pressing the PayPal button, and we'll look forward to tuning back in two weeks from tonight. I don't know, maybe we should do headlights. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff on here about headlights. We had uh, Rodolfo was on from Mexico, Although I couldn't raise him, I don't know he, if he was off or something. And Norm Ewing was on from Johannesburg, South Africa. That's really nice to know. We always have people from Canada, almost consider us the same country up here. Um, anyway, I want to thank everybody for being on and participating. And if you want to unmute yourself now, that's fine. We'll just chat for a little bit and, and in a couple of minutes we'll wind up. So good night. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank uh, you. Good night. Thanks, John. Thanks, Kent. It was good to hear from night, you again. John. Enjoyed it. Night, John. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you, John. Good night, John. Good night. Thanks a lot. Good night, John. Good night, John. Okay. All right. Barney, thanks for coming on and answering questions. Bob and Gloria, thank you for being here all, all the time. That, that's nice. We try. Uh, you know, thank, thank you, John. Thank you, John. John, I got to tell you what the uh, what you told me uh, the other day about that taking all that pollution stuff off that eighty MGB. Yeah, it started immediately, but then the good the bad gas came in. <laughs> and so, so now we're cleaning out. Yeah, I took the carburetor off. The, carburetor. There were a couple of rivets missing out of the float chamber. It's a Stromberg. I don't know why. So we cleaned it. Steve Feck, Steve Shivington cleaned it all up for me. Okay. We're going to put it, but, but as soon as we took all that stuff up, plugged up the, the uh, manifold, it just started right away. The owner was so happy. He was running out telling all his neighbors. <laughs> so, all I did was hook it up right. You know? Yeah. 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 Amazing. So I really appreciate <laughs> Thank that. Thank you. And, you know, your, your PayPal is, uh, is worth it, really. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan, it's nice to see you. I enjoyed your I enjoyed your your comments and the email. So uh, I just didn't get around to sending the thank you notes. It wasn't because I was upset. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even worry about it. I appreciate the help. Okay. All right. So so Jeep. I see Jeep on here. So yep. Yeah. So.
Thank you. Thank you for being here. Mike Rogan, Stuart Mast, yep, thank you very much. Doug, I see you wear your, your pith helmet. I did not wear mine tonight. John, <laughs> it's a jungle out there in the world of MGs. You got to wear it, man. I, I, uh, I, I, if I had my brothers, I'd run away right now and grab my my pith helmet, but I'll do that next <laughs> time. Next time we'll, we'll have that. Yeah, we'll see how many people. We'll see how many people have fifth helmets. I have three. I know, wow. Doug, Doug, I know you always have more than I do, but um, I got an original. John, got yeah. original. John, John any, anything worth doing is worth getting carried away with. That's my <laughs> motto. So. It's been my experience that um, almost every, in fact, every MG mechanic that I know is a bit eccentric. And I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> I think that's probably a true statement. <laughs> Did I wear my fed? <laughs> <laughs> I've got a pith helmet that belonged to my late wife's grandfather. Uh, he wore it when he's in the British Army, so it's an honest to goodness true pith helmet. I've got one like you're wearing now, Doug. You've seen that one. I used to wear that at summer parties. Then I've got another one that I bought when uh, when a bunch of us went out to Philmont in the Boy Scouts. I wore that out there in 1963. <laughs> So, yeah, I've had those. Bill Rosevere, nice to see you tonight. Thank you very much for being here. Okay. Hey, John. Yes. I went to Philmont when I was a Boy Scout, but I have no idea where it is. Philmont or the, or the, or, or the Fifth Helmet? No, Philmont. <laughs> the Boy Scout camp. New Mexico, Cimarron, New Mexico. Okay. Oh, it that, was a... I've heard that word in so many years. <laughs> and it was like, wow, Philmont, I remember being there. Yeah, and somehow, somehow, the you know, the Boy Scouts got sued. It's it's so unfortunate. Um, and they, you know, they, they've gone broke. They've gone through a reorganization. But somehow they were able to, I don't know, put Philmont out on a 501c3 or something or other and, and keep it from getting claimed. Because that's, uh, what is that? I don't know, 100 square miles or something of... of uh, Trampled, trampled grasslands and, and uh, forest and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I was a boy scout, so it's been some time. How much about it? Yeah. I thought it was, I imagine it was the hill country because it seems a lot like central Texas, but I, again, I didn't know. I, I wanted to ask about the cylinder head though, because that was my question earlier. Yeah. So I've got a, I've got under twelve thousand miles on an M, on a newly rebuilt MGB engine, and I believe the head gasket blew because the oil. I just replaced the fuel pump because it failed. But unlike previous fuel pump failures I've experienced, where the fuel just stops pumping, this was delivering just extremely low volume. Okay. So I've got the head off, and I've got this one centimeter gap between cylinders three and four. Um, I put some very light oil in the cylinder head, inverted it, and let it sit overnight, and there was no leakage around the, no, no leakage. It was like, it wasn't like motor oil, it was like, um, I used my hydraulic jack oil. Okay. That um, uh, but there's quite a bit of carbon buildup. Yeah, get, Otherwise get rid of the carbon. Yeah, my machinist was like, be very careful about getting it in the, you know, like between the rings and the cylinders. Yeah, just you, you put oil in there. That's, that's, and yes. all that stuff will float in the oil. Okay. Uh, either, yeah. either because it's lighter or the surface tension or something. But he told me to do the same thing as you did. He's like, take a Sharpie and, and then write, and write it on your, on, clean your, clean the surface off, take a Sharpie and then get a flat stone and run it back and forth. And if it takes all the, um, takes all the ink off, then you know your cylinder head's flat. He's like, you have to have a very flat stone, though. Yeah, you have to have a really flat stone. I don't even know where you come up with that. More likely than that, you'd end up with a steel plate and a, um, wrapped, wrapped with some uh, sandpaper. So, Amazon's yeah. got them, John. Uh, they're nice sharpening blocks. OK. <laughs> Every day is a new day here. <laughs> yeah, I got one I've been using for decades. This is eight inch whetstone I bought at the hardware store. <clears throat> it's the only thing I ever use it for is polishing the top of the engine block. Okay. Well, I actually sharpen knives with mine too. <laughs> well, then, then it gets like this, right? Yeah. Yeah, the one my father had had a had a valley and had a saddle from being used so much. 
Well, gentlemen, ladies, I must I must take my leave. So thank you very kindly. And and we'll look forward to doing this again in two weeks. And who knows? Send me you, you want to talk about something specific? Send me an email. Although I, I want to get Larry uh, Larry Sonata here um, with, with his uh, Mag. I want to interview him. A lot of people are out there, you know, trying to trying to get people excited and entertain us and, and educate us. And Larry's one of them. So anyway. Ladies, gentlemen. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Good Bye -bye. evening. Cheers, y'all. Thank you, guys. Good night. 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 Good night.